The committee will come to order, please. The Oversight Committee exists to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, I repeat, efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn obligation is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have the right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdog groups to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. Today, more than ever, our opening statement that we do at the beginning rings true with the panel of witnesses we have here. And I will say, led from the middle by Congressman Chris Shays, former member of this committee, and I guess I will include who would be sitting in my chair had he not gone on to these other pursuits. <laughs> Welcome, Chris. Uh, <laughs> You could say you're welcome, right? You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and the other members of the Commission on Work Time Contracting, who in August released a final report with alarming findings about waste and abuse that has occurred in Afghanistan and Iraq. Over the course of two years, the Commission has conducted 25 hearings, which for Chris Shays is only about average, uh, issued five special reports and two interim reports. Its final report presents a sobering view of waste and fraud in the, in the war on terror. An estimated $1.25 trillion has been spent on operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. The report estimates that since 2002, important, since 2002, early on in the Bush administration, the Defense Department has spent $206 billion of, the, of their contract ob obligations in support of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. At least $31 billion and possibly as much as $60 billion has been lost to contract waste and fraud in America's contingency operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. It is appropriate for the Commission and Congress to assess these costs and the reasons so much taxpayer money has been squandered to waste and fraud. The waste and fraud associated with these expenditures is mind-numbing. With the coming transition of operations from DOD to State Department in Iraq, as well as the continued surge uh, uh, in, in Afghanistan that includes civilian and federal workforce, costs associated with contractors are likely to increase. For example, the State Department will increase its manpower from 8,000 to 17,000. The great majority of those will be contractors for security, medical maintenance, aviation, and other functions. The State Department is building a virtual private army of private security contractors in Iraq. Some have estimated that as many as 5,500 new contractors will be necessary to protect and operate the U.S. Embassy and its facilities and functions throughout Iraq. In Afghanistan, the number of civilian employees drawn from departments such as State, Treasury, Justice, and Agriculture has tripled since 2009. That is the number of civilian employees has tripled since 2009, uh, rising from just over 300 to over 1,000 as of June 2011. Supporting and protection, protecting this growth in additional staff uh, will require continued use of private contractors under the current plan. We have reached a point where we are now forced to treat contractors as the default option. This is because Federal agencies can't compete, uh, can't, sorry, can't complete, compete, no, can't complete <laughs> mission critical functions, nor can they manage the, uh, an, o an overseas large contractor force of unprecedented size that at times has outnumbered troops in the field. When President Obama took office, he pledged to eliminate waste, fraud, and abuse in these areas. And I might comment, so has virtually every president. Instead, we are growing more and more 
reliant on contractors. New and increasing problems have come at, the at a time when President Obama has failed to fill key leadership positions that ensure effective oversight uh, is unbroken. He has failed to implement essential measures to combat the waste and fraud. The record of waste and fraud will continue unless Afghanistan takes concrete actions to protect precious taxpayer dollars. I apologize, unless the administration takes uh, precautions. The United States has not achieved peace and will not get a peace dividend unless we, in fact, are able to stem waste both created within our government and by our partners in Iraq and Afghanistan. Today we will examine these difficult challenges and explore the conclusions and recommendations offered by the Commission on Wartime Contracting. But before I do, sorry, but before we do, I want to make one thing very clear. Operations in Afghanistan and Iraq have levied a heavy human toll. 7,520 Americans and coalition soldiers have been lost. Our brave men and women serving on the front lines continue to, be, to do an outstanding job fighting our enemies and securing freedom for those who terrorized or would terrorize us and oppress other, uh, other nations. Nothing in this hearing nor the recommendations of the Wartime Contracting Commission is intended to question their efforts or their commitment. Congress must recognize we are not there in harm's way. And those who are there in harm's way are doing the best they can. Rather, it is for this committee to evaluate the systems and the recommendations of this commission to recognize this is not a problem that began on this President's watch. This is not a problem that will end no matter what we do. But we do have an obligation to do everything we can to assist the administration by systems and support to reduce waste and fraud, to reduce inefficiency, and to provide our best advice both through this Commission and through our own efforts to an administration who has, has in fact, countless thousands of men and women in harm's way. And with that, I will recognize the distinguished ranking member for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And um, first let me uh, say that uh, I understand that Mr. Mike Tebow will not be able to be with us this morning. I understand that you will be putting his full statement in the record, which we uh, would appreciate and would join you in. Uh, Mr. Tebow worked with our committee closely in the past, and, and we sincerely appreciate his career, public service, and his expertise. Uh, Chairman Shays, it is uh, great to have you back again before the committee, which you served on so many years. And thank you for all the, to all the commissioners for being with us today. Over the past decade, the United States has grown increasingly reliant on contractors to provide support services to the military, the State Department and USAID. In Iraq and Af in, Af in, in Afghanistan, contractors outnumber service members and they perform essential tasks, such as shipping supplies through hostile territory and providing security to bases and personnel. Since 2001, we have spent more than $200 billion won these contracts. After an extensive bipartisan investigation, the Commission on Wartime Contracting estimated that as much as $60 billion may have been lost to waste and fraud due to a lack of effective competition, oversight and enforcement in contingency contracting. Although the scope of this contracting problem is daunting, it is not new to this committee. Under Chairman Henry Waxman's leadership, the committee examined problems with the military's log cap contract for logistical support, the government's multiple contracts with Blackwater USA for security services, and the State Department's bloated billion-dollar contract to build the United States Embassy in Baghdad. Chairman, Chairman Towns continued this work by examining the system used by the executive branch to track contractors and waste in USAID's reconstruction contracts. And under Representative, Representative Tierney's leadership, the National Security Subcommittee uncovered evidence that the United States trucking contractors and their private security providers 
were involved in a massive protection racket that sent U.S. taxpayer dollars into the hands of warlords, power break brokers, and the Taliban. Our committee's oversight efforts have resulted in significant changes. In Iraq, the State Department has dramatically increased its management of private security contractors, and the number of use of force incidents has plummeted. In Afghanistan, General Petraeus responded to Chairman Tierney's investigation by issuing new contracting guidelines and charging two task force with tracking U.S. contracting dollars to re reduce corruption. But despite these worthy investigations to root out waste, fraud, and abuse after it happens, more must be done to prevent waste from occurring in the first place. In its final report, the Commission has given us a road map, and a very good one at that, for reform that includes 32 recommendations for both Congress and the Executive Branch. These reforms require increasing competition, oversight, and enforcement. If we cannot put in place the personnel to oversee contractors in war zones, then we need to rethink the mission rather than blindly pressing forward with poorly designed contracts. Finally, to the Commissioners, let me thank you for three years of dedication and hard work. You pursued your mandate in a very vigorous, fair, and bipartisan manner in the best tradition of the Truman Committee. You have accomplished your mission by providing us with a historical account of the mistakes that were made and a guidebook to the reforms necessary to prevent them in the future. Now it is up to us, to Congress, to implement your recommendations. Mr. Tierney has taken the lead in introducing a bill to implement one of the Commission's principal recommendations, establishing a permanent Inspector General for the Contingency Operations. I urge my colleagues to support that legislation. I hope that the Chairman will work with me and Representative Tierney and others uh, on the outside to focus more of our Committee's resources on this issue. I agree with the Chairman. This is indeed a bipartisan uh, effort. We must address this in a bipartisan way, just as the Commission has set a wonderful example for us. And we do appreciate you. And so I am looking forward to hearing your testimony. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. We will now recognize the Chairman of the Subcommittee on National Security, Mr. Chaffetz, for his opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you to all of you who have poured uh, years of talent and expertise and effort into, into producing such a uh, quality document. Thank you for your, your time and effort. I only hope that we, uh, we look towards it and we implement it and we, uh, we make positive changes. So, again, thank you. Uh, the American people are faced with the prospect that their government has wasted somewhere between $31 and $60 billion on contracting since 2002. From your report uh, in Chapter 3, I will read, quote, The Commission estimates that at mid-range waste, mid waste and fraud during contingency operations in Iraq and Afghanistan averaged about $12 million every day for the past tw 10 years, end quote. According to the Commission, this is due to ill conceived project, poor planning and oversight, poor performance by contractors, criminal behavior, and just good old flash and blatant uh, corruption. This is unforgivable. While some may agree or disagree with our engagements in Iraq and Afghanistan, it is universally unacceptable to waste taxpayer money. According to the Commission, quote, unless changes are made, continued waste and fraud will undercut the effectiveness of money spent in future operations, end quote. These observations aren't new, however. Many, including this committee, have highlighted the waste, fraud, and abuse since the war has begun. And I compliment Mr. Tierney and others who have spent a lot of time uh, highlighting this. Unfortunately, oversight has not improved necessarily during this administration. As it doubles down on foreign policy agenda, this administration intends to dramatically increase the use of contractors before first addressing the lack of oversight. I'd like to read from uh, the executive uh, summary, page two here. It says, quote, the number of Defense Department Department of State and U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, contractor employees in Iraq and Afghanistan has varied, but exceeded 260,000 in 2010. The contractor employee count has at times surpassed the number of U.S. military personnel in the two countries. Most contractor employees are third country nationals and local nationals. U.S. nationals totaled more than 46,000, a minority of those employed something that we obviously need to look at. In Iraq, for example, the State Department's footprint will increase to nearly 17,000 
after the Department of Defense withdraws on December 31, 2011. Many of these will be private contractors. To that end, the President and the Secretary of State will hire an additional 5,500 private security contractors to compensate for the troop withdrawal. This private army will fill the gap left by our troops. In other words, the President will remove the troops but increase the level of private security contractors. At the same time, the President is doing little to strengthen the oversight. According to the Commission's report, the State Department, quote, is struggling to resolve budget issues and prepare requirements for awarding large number of contracts, along with mobilizing the many U.S. government civilians need to effectively manage these contracts, end quote. Thousands of contractors operating without proper oversight is an unacceptable scenario. It will lead to the same type of waste, fraud, and abuse that is at issue here today. There are solutions, however. At a first step, President Obama and the Senate should fill critical, critical vacancies within the Federal Government. Currently, the State Department and the SIGR are leaderless. USAIG, IG, USAID IG is retiring at the end of this month. These are basic steps and very critical components and personnel that we need in place in order to make sure that the proper oversight is in, is in place. I again look forward to hearing from the panel. I appreciate the work of the members that have done here before. But thank you again for your good work, and I look forward to a candid discussion today. I yield back. Thank you. We now recognize the subcommittee ranking member, the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney, for his opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for calling this hearing today. Uh, I want to thank all the commissioners uh, for their great work over the past three years, and I think it is a great example of public service. Uh, your previous public service uh, meant that none of us were surprised by the effort and the uh, expertise that you brought to it, but I certainly want you to know that we can't express our gratitude probably loud enough and clear enough, and I, I hope the American people understand the sacrifice uh, that you put into doing this job, and you had many other things you could have been doing with your time and effort, so your citizenship is greatly appreciated. Look, I authored, uh, and so I was, and I was pleased to have Jim Leach, uh, my Republican counterpart, co-sponsor co the legislation that became the Commission on Wartime Contracting. So I take special pride in the success that you have had and the fact that you did a good job, and with the leadership of Mike Thibault and, and my friend Chris Shays, who just left one hat and put on the other hat and went about doing the same thing he had always been doing, which was good, thorough oversight work, and we appreciate that. And if it hadn't been for Senators Webb and McCaskill and others in the Senate who picked up the cudgel there and moved forward, it may never become legislation. So uh, we think it's a great bicameral, bipartisan effort on that, which was important. We fashioned this after the so-called Truman Commission, uh, and we did that on the notion that people would know that it was not going to be partisan and the idea was not to be attacking any executive or administration in particular, but the notion that whenever we get into a contingency operation, there will be those who try to take advantage of the situation in some circumstances and of themselves without any purposeful bad acts lend themselves to uh, mismanagement uh, or abuse on that. And so the Commission was authorized and charged with identifying the scope of the wasteful contingency contracting and recommending reforms, and you did just that. But the results of your work are sobering, uh, as many have already mentioned. Billions of dollars wasted by agencies that had little capacity to manage the contractors or to even hold them accountable. And billions of dollars more have been dedicated to projects that were poorly conceived and are probably unsustainable by the host government. So these findings are consistent with the Committee's own oversight of private security contractors in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I think we have already mentioned here that last year I led a six-month subcommittee investigation of the $2 billion Department of Defense trucking contract in Afghanistan. Uh, our investigation found that the trucking contract had spawned a vast protection racket in which warlords, criminals and insurgents extorted contractors for protection payments to obtain safe passage. Uh, our investigation further showed that senior officials within the United States military contracting chain of command had been aware of that problem uh, but had done little to address it. Two weeks ago, the National Security Subcommittee had a follow-up hearing with three Defense uh, Department witnesses to address those issues. I asked General Townsend, the Director of the Pakistan-Afghanistan Coordination Cell of the Joint Staff, whether contractor protection payments to warlords, power brokers and insurgents were necessary for safe passage in Afghanistan. He said they were, and in many cases they don't have a choice, in his exact words. I then asked Gary Motzik, the head of the contingency contracting at the Department of Defense, whether such payments are legal under the United States law. He stated that they absolutely were not legal. So in other words, the Department of Defense designed a critical contract to which it was necessary in their terms for the contractors to make illegal protection payments that in many cases found, were used against the very forces uh, to, to attack our troops. I mean, it is just unheard of, I think, in other situations. And 
So I, my fear is that the committees and your investigation, the Commission's investigations are only the tip of the iceberg. And I think your work has shown that as well. Much of the Afghan economy now centers around the United States and international military presence. Many of the Afghan elite have their own logistics contracts with the United States, and a significant portion of these funds seem to end up supporting the Dubai real estate market rather than jobs in Afghanistan. Today, the business of Afghanistan is war. How can we ever hope to extricate ourselves from that war when so many Afghans benefit from the insecurity that is used to justify our continued presence? To my mind, we have crossed a tipping point in which the size of our military footprint inadvertently fosters further instability. Every additional soldier and every additional supply convoy that we send to Afghanistan further fuels the cycle of dependence, corruption, and endless war. Simply stated, we cannot afford to fail at getting a handle on contingency contracting, waste, fraud, and abuse in Iraq and Afghanistan. Not only does it squander precious taxpayer resources, it can seriously undermine the mission and even fund those who attack our brave men and women in uniform. In that vein, I have introduced legislation to establish a Special Inspector General for Overseas Contingency Operations. The efforts of the Commission, along with the Special Inspector General for Iraq and the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan, have shown the critical importance of real-time oversight in our overseas operations. We need to preserve the unique capabilities of these three entities in a single permanent Inspector General with a flexible, deployable cadre of oversight specialists. I urge my colleagues to join me in this legislation. Finally, I am also working to tackle many of the Commission's other legislative reform recommendations, which were excellent and on point. It is a challenging task, but with your great work, uh, that will serve as a blueprint for us, our efforts that go forward. I want to thank you again for your service and your testimony here today. Uh, I look forward to our discussion, and I want to thank you again, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Chaffetz as well, for keeping this a, a nonpartisan, bipartisan effort uh, that is all about oversight and making sure that this institution of Congress does its job with respect to any administration that might be in at any particular time. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. All members will have seven days to submit opening statements and extraneous material for the record. Additionally, the commissioners here entire, who will not be giving opening statements, there will be just one, I believe, uh, your opening statements or, or other prepared remarks or extraneous material will be placed in the record, uh, with, including Mr. Tebow, who unfortunately was diverted. His plane was literally diverted or he would be with you. Without objection, that is so ordered. We now recognize the panel. The previously mentioned Honorable Chris Shays is the Republican co-chair of the Commission on Wartime Contracting. Congressman Shays represented Connecticut's 4th Congressional District from 1987 until 2009, and he is sorely missed. Commissioner Clark Kent Irvin was Inspector General of the Department of Homeland Security from 2003 to 2005. <clears throat> Commissioner Robert J. Henke was the Assistant Secretary for Management at the Department of Veterans Affairs from 2005 to 2009. Commissioner Catherine Shinazi, good enough, okay, good. I, I don't usually get them even that close, was the Managing Director of, for Acquisition and Sourcing Management at the Government Accountability Office, our wing that we trust so much for the work that we must do. Uh, and Commissioner uh, Charles Tiefer is a professor of law at the University of Baltimore Law School, and Commissioner do Dov S. Zachheim, well, I grew up in a Jewish name, but it is a little easier for me, I guess, uh, was the controller for the Department of Defense from 2001 to 2004. Lady and gentlemen, pursuant to the committee uh, rules, I would ask you all to rise to take a sworn oath. <clears throat> and please raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the te testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record indicate that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Please be seated. My prepared statement says, in order to allow sufficient time, uh, blah, 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 look at the light, it is going to be different this time. I understand only one commissioner will be speaking. Uh, within any amount of reasonable time, you may have to, prepare, to deliver your entire prepared statement and such remarks as you may want to have represent all of the commissioners. With that. Mr. Hankey, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Issa, uh, Ranking Member Cummings, members of the committee, good morning and thank you for inviting us here today. I am Robert Hankey, a member of the Commission on Wartime Contracting in Iraq and Afghanistan.
which completed its official work last Friday. Previously, I served as the Assistant Secretary for Management at the Department of Veterans Affairs and the Principal Deputy Comptroller at DOD. I am presenting this statement on behalf of uh, Commission Co-Chairs Christopher Shays and Mike Thibault and my fellow Commissioners Clark Ken Irvin, Catherine Shanazi, Charles Tiefer, and Dove Zackheim, who are here, and Grant Green, who could not be here with us today. I respectfully request that our full written statement be a part of the record, as well as a copy of our report, Transforming Wartime Contract. Without objection, so ordered. We very much appreciate the opportunity to appear before this committee, the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. Our eight reports to Congress are a direct match with this committee's central mandate, the need for vigorous oversight and fundamental reforms. The Commissioners would emphasize that we have operated not only as a bipartisan body, but truly as a nonpartisan body. Our reports have no dissenting views. We are unanimous both in our findings and in our recommendations. We unanimously conclude that the need for change, whether through laws, policies, practices, and ultimately organizational culture, is urgent, is urgent for five reasons. First, reforms can still save money in Iraq and Afghanistan avoid unintended consequences, and improve our foreign policy outcomes there. Second, dollars wasted, uh, the dollars wasted and the dollars still at risk are significant. The Commission estimates that at least $31 billion and possibly as much as $60 billion of the $206 billion spent on contracts and grants in Iraq and Afghanistan has been lost to waste and fraud. We have also warned that many billions more, possibly even exceeding the billions already lost, may turn into waste if the host governments cannot or will not sustain U.S.-funded programs and projects. Third, although U.S. policy has for more than 20 years considered contractors to be part of the total force, we went into Afghanistan and Iraq unprepared to manage and oversee the thousands of contracts and contractors used there. Think about that for a minute. We, we went into Iraq and Afghanistan. We went into war unprepared. Some improvements have been made, yes, but after a decade of war, the government remains unable to ensure that taxpayers and warfighters and diplomats are getting good value for contract dollars spent. Fourth, new contingencies, whatever form they take, will occur. And strikingly, Federal agencies have acknowledged that they cannot perform large operations without contractor support. They are very candid in that regard. Fifth and finally, reform is urgent because failure to enact powerful reforms will guarantee that new cycles of waste and fraud will accompany the response to that next contingency. Our work in Iraq and Afghanistan found problems similar or even identical to those in peacetime contracting, including poor planning, limited or no competition, weak management of performance, and insufficient recovery of overbillings and unsupported costs. Of course, the wartime environment brings tremendous additional complications. The dollar volumes swell dramatically, and the urgency of dynamic operations and hostile threats directly impact contracting decisions, execution, and oversight. Now, despite those tremendous challenges, we are clear uh, as a Commission that contracting and contractors have provided vital and, for the most part, highly effective support for U.S. contingency operations. However, the bottom line is this. We rely on contractors too heavily. We manage them too loosely, and we pay too much for what we get. The wasteful contract outcomes in Iraq and Afghanistan demonstrate that Federal agencies' dependence on contractors, while acknowledged, is not thought to be important enough to warrant the thorough planning and superb execution that a contingency that wartime demands. The Commission has concluded that the problems need to be attacked on several levels. The first is holding contractors accountable. Federal statutes and regulations provide 
ways to protect the government against bad contractors and to impose accountability on them. Unfortunately, we found that these mechanisms are often not vigorously applied and enforced, and incentives to constrain waste are often not in place. The Commission's research has shown, for example, that some contractors have been billing the government for years using inadequate accounting systems that don't pass muster. Recommendations for suspension and debarment go unimplemented with little documentation for the decision. Past performance data on how a contractor performs is very often unrecorded and even less likely to be used for the next contract award. Staffing shortages have led to a defense contract audit agency uh, backlog of nearly $600 billion in unaudited work, delaying recovery of possible overpayments. The government has also been remiss in promoting one of the most effective of all disciplines, competition. We recommend better application of existing tools to ensure accountability and strengthening those tools. Our report contains recommendations to bolster competition, improve the recording and use of past performance data, expanding U.S. civil jurisdiction as part of contract awards, and requiring official approval of significant subcontracting overseas. The second level is holding the government itself more accountable for the decision to use contractors and the subsequent results. Taking a harder look at what projects and programs to undertake with contractors must also include thinking more carefully about whether to use contractors in foreign policy situations. Our report recommends careful consideration of the risks created by contracting and phasing out the use of private security contractors for some functions. Another part of the government's problem is resources. As this committee knows well, both military force structure and the federal acquisition workforce were downsized during the 1990s. This ensured that if a large and prolonged contingency should develop, the military would greatly increase its reliance on contractors, while at the very same time, its ability to manage and oversee them, to manage and oversee those contractors, had been significantly reduced. Now, even when the government has good policies in place, effective practices, which are often different, ranging from planning and requirements definition to providing adequate oversight of performance and coordinating interagency activities, are lacking. We have recommended steps that would improve the government's handling of contingency contracting. They include developing deployable acquisition cadres and professionals, elevating the position and so the importance, uh, elevating the position of agency senior acquisition officers and the importance of acquisition as a core competency, and creating a J-10, a contingency contracting directorate at the Pentagon's joint staff, where the broad range of contracting activities is still treated as a minor subset of logistics. Considering this committee's broad and cross-agency mandate, I would also call special attention to two recommendations with a whole-of-government approach. The first is to establish a dual-hatted position for an official who would serve both at the Office of Management and Budget and simultaneously on the National Security Council. Such a dual-hatted position such a dual-headed person would promote better visibility, coordination, budget guidance, and strategic direction. They would link foreign policy goals with budget resources. The second is to create a permanent IG organization for use during contingencies. The special IGs for Iraq and Afghanistan reconstruction have performed valuable service, but they will go away, leaving the need to reinvent them and suffer delays in deploying IG staff when the next contingency does emerge. The work of Sagir and Sagar have shown the drawbacks of creating organizations that are limited in functional authority, geographic location, and time. A permanent contingency IG with a small but deployable and expandable staff trained in the unique circumstances of a contingency operation can provide cross-agency oversight from day one of a contingency. 
More details on these recommendations appear in our final report, uh, the 240-page Transforming Wartime Contracting. Now, in, in compliance with its authorizing statute, our Commission has closed its doors, but the problems we have diagnosed remain very much alive. Corrective action, in some cases requiring limited financial investments, are essential on both the government and the contractor side of the equation to reform contingency contracting. Your sustained attention during and after the reform process will be essential to ensure that reforms are institutionalized and that, ultimately, cultures are changed. In summary, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Cummings, wartime contracting uh, reform is an essential, not a luxury good. Whatever form it takes, there will be a next contingency, and the responses to that contingency will all but certainly require contractor support. The government would be foolish to ignore the lessons of the past decade and refuse to prepare and refuse to prepare for better use of contracting resources. Once the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq fade uh, into the past, it will be all too easy to put off taking action. Your committee is in a superb position to prevent exactly that from happening. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, this concludes our formal statement. We very much appreciate this opportunity to be here with you today in a dialogue, and we would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. And with that, I will recognize myself for a first round of questions. Commissioner uh, Shinazi, uh, there has been a number of suggestions coming out of the Commission. Obviously, uh, your colleague just mentioned the uh, a permanent IG to oversee contingencies. If we do not have the IGs that are already authorized in place on a consistent basis, are we fairly, in your opinion, seeing how much would be done, how much waste would be reduced, or are we asking for yet another uh, IG? Well, in fact, if that position remains unfilled, we would be at least as bad, uh, you know, in as much trouble as far as, you know, if we have a new IG and that one uh, has no leader. So I would like your thoughts on that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as you might expect. As you might expect, I am a supporter of the IG community coming out of the account community after May. It wasn't an accident I called on you. But, um, but this also was a, a unanimous um, uh, recommendation. No, and I understand the recommendation for yet another IG, but I would like the, you know, with your experience, when you have a vacancy and you have a series of actings, or even sometimes the acting is gone for a while, what does that do to the effectiveness of an IG organization? I think what you see in the example of the Special Inspector General for Afghani Reconstruction is, is a perfect example of that. Um, it took a long, long time to set that organization up. It took longer to staff it. Uh, it was difficult to find a leader. Um, that leader, as you know, uh, left the organization, and it is now without a leader. It is clearly not as effective an organization as it needs to be. That said, what we are trying to do with this recommendation is to avoid that from happening in the future. Um, we well, but that goes to, begs the same question. If there is no contingency going on at a given time, isn't it likely? And, and by the way, I am supportive of the, the mm -hmm. basic recommendation, but I still have to ask, if we don't think we have a contingency at some time, isn't it likely that that position will stay open so that instead of being shovel ready, uh, they will be scrambling to regrow a, a hollowed out position? Uh, at the very moment that you, you, the fit hits the shan. And I appreciate that question. I think one of the things that um, surprised me was just how involved we have been in contingencies. Um, you can define that in different ways. Right. I, I, would, I would make the point that we are always in contingencies and that once we have this position, it will always have something to do. Let me, let me go on to a couple more questions. Uh, Commissioner Shays, for you I have the question, isn't it true from history that the Truman Commission was actually put together to a great extent because they wanted to have a friendly person looking after FDR's uh, spending in the war, and they, they hoped that he would he'd be kinder and gentler. But in fact, because he was in early in a war, 
and ongoing and held hundreds of hearings, traveled extensively along with the other members of a what was effectively a wartime standing committee, not really a commission, but really a committee of a senator, uh, that you had vigorous oversight. Isn't the history of that that committees like ours or some committee of Congress needs to be charged from the beginning of the war with an ongoing oversight of the conduct and expenditure of that war, similar to Truman? The answer is yes. And uh, this committee is a great example because you don't just look at DOD, you look at state, you look at USAID, you, you, you aren't stovepiped. And um, I will tell you what happens when you start looking at waste, fraud, and abuse is you get really angry because what is happening is treasonous action is taking place. The people who commit fraud are, are basically committing, in my judgment, treason. So I imagine that um, uh, Senator Truman at the time just got pissed off. Well, uh, and Commissioner Henke, uh, because you haven't served on this side of the dais, this may be more appropriate to ask you. One of the problems that your commission report has seen is that we are about to go to a large standing army of contractors very similar to Blackwater. How would you view that we should intercede in a policy decision that has been made that will, in fact, cause a large amount of contractors to be there under State Department who are we doing what I think on both sides of the dais we would call an inherently governmental task of being effectively quasi-military supporters of the State Department's agenda in Afghanistan, I mean, in Iraq? Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, a couple of weeks ago, OMB published a new guidance letter on defining what inherently governmental is. And long story short, on that list for the first time, they included uh, security in a combat zone. Those aren't the precise words, but that's the meaning. We strongly think that's the right answer, that OMB took a risk-based approach to that. Now, the, the challenge with doing anything different in the short term for the State Department is it takes years to grow diplomatic security agents or security specialists. Um, it would be difficult, if not impossible, for the State Department to grow 5,500 or 7,000. So right now they are in that situation that we described and that you used in your opening statement. They have no choice. They got there by default. They don't have the organic capacity to be, uh, to be expeditionary, to be uh, in a combat zone for very long. And uh, state is facing a very dynamic situation in Iraq, and they have no choice but to go out and contract for those the, the security that, that they need. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, if I, if I could yeah, add to that, please. please. Um, <clears throat> first of all, uh, it's my understanding, and it's worth for this committee to explore, whether state actually considers that it is limited by the OMB circular. My understanding is that it doesn't think so. It thinks it's only applying to DOD, and that's a major issue right there. Secondly, um, one possibility, one possible way around the dilemma that uh, Bob Henke just laid out before you, which is a very real dilemma, is to have better oversight. If you're stuck with contractors, at least have people that oversee them. And if you cannot get people from within the State Department, get them from other federal agencies. I don't know that there's a law that prevents that. People are seconded to other agencies all the time. So there are ways of dealing with it if the government wanted to. The problem all along has been implementation and will. Thank you. With that, I recognize the ranking member for his question. Just to uh, follow up on what you just said, Commissioner, um, we are better than this, aren't we? In other words, we, we as a country are better than what we are doing right now. It sounds like if there was a will, we would find a way. And it has got to be a will. And, I mean, are you, I can't hear you. I want this on the record. Uh, I mean, you can respond. No, I, I, I couldn't agree more, sir. Uh, I have served uh, in the executive branch twice at, at pretty senior levels. Uh, and that is exactly the case. When there is no will, there are millions of reasons why you can't do anything. Mm -hmm. And when you want to do something, it is amazing how quickly it can get done. And so uh, I fully agree with what you are saying. It comes down to the will of, of the executive branch to implement what this committee and the Congress are concerned about. The uh, Commissioner says the final report estimated up to $60 billion 
may have been lost to contracting waste fraud in, in Afghanistan and Iraq. In other words, up to 30 cents of every dollar may have gone down the drain. And I, I, could, I was watching you, uh, Commissioner Shays, and when you were talking about treason just a few moments ago, and I could see it really upset you, and as it would upset all of us, particularly when we are scrapping for dollars and we got this super committee meeting about, you know, trying to figure out where we save money, and, and then for people to see money um, going down the tubes like this, it, 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 it's got to be aggravating. But it does something else. It causes citizens, if they're watching this, to say, you know what, you know, they don't get it. They're not, and, and, and so they, don't, they lose confidence in government, and that's something that we have been tackling here, trying to address. So, Commissioner Shays, what is the single most important thing we can do to tackle this waste, fraud, and abuse uh, in contingency contracting? The, the one thing, you know what, because I, I was just telling the staff, it sounds like this stuff is so big, well, we I, need to take it chunk by chunk, and I'm trying to figure out what's the first chunk we take. Could you ask other members as well? Sure. But I'm I, I, I would say if I'm only given one, we're trying to do too much. And, and by, by, we're just trying to do too much, and as a result, uh, we're not thinking the projects out well, we're not overseeing them well, and we're not even really evaluating, do we really need it? Do we really need to do as much as we're doing? If you're only giving me one choice, that's my choice. Uh, yeah. Commissioner Tiefer, if you don't mind, since you're from my neighborhood, the University of Baltimore is literally within five minutes of my house. Sir, don't talk about the University of Baltimore. <laughs> he will keep you here all day talking about it. <laughs> Welcome. It's a fine neighborhood. Uh, yes, thank you. Baltimore. Um, uh, my particular interest in the Commission was in Chapter 3, which was about lack of competition. Uh, uh, and, and uh, serious waste and so forth. And uh, I would say the, the number one thing that I personally uh, think we could do better and we are not doing well enough is compete these contracts. It would be so easy to set a level of competition and say that the Defense Department must meet it uh, for its contingency contract. But, but, Professor, you hear all the time, you know, when you see these 60-minute shows and shows like that, and they say, you know, there are only a few companies, and I'm talking about, like, sometimes they say two or three that can do certain things, that can provide certain types of security. I mean, have you all found that to be true? And is that, how does that affect competition? The, the, the answer is no. Um, and I'll take a, a, a precise point. In Afghanistan, we have uh, a contractor that handles North Afghanistan for logistics and a contractor that handles South Afghanistan for lo logistics. And when new work comes in, as in connection with the, the big surge that we had, it automatically, without competition, goes to one or the other. We don't compete it at all, even though there are obviously two contractors in place, at least, who could do the work. And I would imagine that if people see that uh, before, you know, see that early on, they probably, we, we keep hearing that companies will not, when companies cannot see the future, uh, that they don't hire and whatever, I guess, if they know that the competition, the, the game is already rigged before they even get in the game, they're definitely not going to be hiring people because they figure they're not going to get the job. I mean, is that May, a fair may I add to that, yes. uh, Mr. Cummings? Mr. I completely Irving. agree with what Professor Tiefer said about the importance of competition among contractors. But I think the missing piece that we haven't talked about a lot to date in the hearing is the importance of having an alternative to contractors. The reason there is no option, largely, but to use contractors, whatever the state of competition is among contractors, is that there is not sufficient organic capacity within government itself to perform these core missions, to do logistics, to do reconstruction, to do security. So at the same time that we promote more vigorous oversight, at the same time, we promote more competition among contractors. We have got to, even in these tight budgetary times, and I would argue especially because of these tight budgetary times, regrow organic capacity within government so that we have an alternative to contract. You know, you make a good point. Um, uh, the, when I was chairman of the Coast Guard subcommittee, one of the things that we discovered when we were doing, doing deep water uh, was that we didn't have in the Coast Guard the acquisitions people. And so when they put together a contract, they put a contract together that was controlled by the contractors. They decided when performance was done, when bonuses were done, everything. 
And so now we had to go backwards because we were buying boats that didn't float. And so we had to go backwards and then get the Coast Guard to grow in-house the things that they needed, and now they're doing pretty good, very good as a matter of fact. So uh, you make a good point. Again, I want to thank all of you for being here. I've got to be over in another hearing with uh, Fed Chair Bernanke. But thank you all for what you're doing, and we're going to do everything in our power to bring life to what you all have done. We really do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I'll now recognize myself for, for five minutes. And again, I can't thank you enough for the great work that you've done. I want to explore a little bit this recommendation number nine, creating a permanent office of Inspector General for Contingency Operations, which, as I read and I look at it, seems to me to be um, really a very ne negative um, uh, consequence of what's happening at State, Department of Defense, and USAID primarily in that they're failing. As you point out on page 17 of uh, your report, the United States has engaged in 56 ventures abroad for other than normal peacetime purposes since 1962. In other words, we haven't, this isn't brand new. This contingency, as you point out also on this, for the past 12 years, the United States has always and simultaneously been engaged in two or more overseas. And so the question that really it begs to me is, you're recommending that we create another IG and yet, I look at the IGs and they're failing. Three of the five IGs that we're supposed to have in place have not been either recommended by the President or confirmed by the United States Senate. So we have three openings out of the five, and yet you want to have a sixth. Yes, I May I start there, Mr. Chapitz? Yeah. As you know, I was the Inspector General, the first Inspector General, in fact, to the Department of Homeland Security, and before that I was the Inspector General of the State Department. So I'm very focused on the Inspector General community. I really agree largely with the premise of your question, and, and the Chairman raised this issue as well. It, it troubles me that we have the vacancies in the Inspector General community that we have, and I'm especially troubled by the longstanding, I think it's been three years or so, vacancy at the State Department. There's an impending retirement that you're referencing at AID, IG, and there's the Bendis vacancy in Cigar. Having said all that, and I urge the administration to fill those vacancies very, very quickly in the Senate to confirm whomever is, is selected by the administration. But at the same time, I think it's important that our recommendation also be um, implemented. And let me explain the distinction. Even if there were, and there should be, as I say, even if there were confirmed inspectors general in those three agencies, DOD, State, AID, it's still important to have a special inspector general for the following reasons. First of all, each of those statutory inspectors general is limited jurisdiction-wise only to that particular agency, point one. The special inspector general would have jurisdiction over the range of agencies that relate to contingencies, all three of them. Uh, and further, um, uh, there would be uh, the opportunity, because of inter interagency oversight, to ensure that the whole range of issues is, uh, is fully vetted. I, uh one of the questions that I, I, I hope our committee continues to explore is what in the world is wrong over at the Department of Defense? I, I want to read here from, uh, this is uh, page 162, and this has to do with the Defense Contracting Audit Agency, which seems aptly named, but it says, the current unaudited, and you mentioned this in your opening statement, the current unaudited backlog stands at $558 billion, having risen sharply from $406 billion in only nine months. At current staffing levels, DCAA has reported that the backlog will continue to go virtually unchecked and will exceed $1 trillion by 2016. Can I uh, try to yes, tackle that? Yes, please. Try to tackle that one. That would be great. Absolutely. When I was Under Secretary of Defense, uh, Comptroller, DCAA was under me. Uh, DCAA simply doesn't have enough people. It, it is How many people are that? there? When I was there, it was about 4,000. They've added, I think, about another 1,000. It's nothing compared to the level of contracting that's going on and to the number of contracts that are going on. Uh, these are very, very professional folks. Uh, most of them now have CPAs. Many of them come from the outside and then come into government, uh, and much as lawyers do nowadays. But we just don't have enough of them. And this goes to the point that was made earlier by uh, Commissioner Henke and some of my other colleagues, and we all believe this very strongly that even in this time of, of cutting uh, budgets and deficits, uh, there has to be some spending to save money. And uh, it's a matter of being penny wise and pound foolish. If we don't get these people in, we're going to wind up hurting both the government and industry. The government, because there might be money that could be recovered, and industry, because they're not getting paid when they should get paid. If the audit isn't completed, they have a problem, too. Could I just 
uh, I'm going to change the word might to will, <laughs> because uh, it, it is just a proven fact that if uh, you had these audits, uh, you are going to discover uh, bills that were submitted uh, that were either fraudulently submitted or, frankly, just mistakes, and they were paid more than they should be paid. The outrage is that all these companies have to keep these records on file for two, three, four, five, six, seven years. And guess who pays for their having to do that? The government pays for their keeping the records. Um, so this 500 billion million that uh, we're talking, excuse me, 500 billion that we're talking about, million, uh, is going to, is going to uh, just accelerate if you don't reverse it. Well, I guess uh, to my colleagues, uh, what I would highlight here is also that the GAO just released, recently released a report in September 2011 documented that there are at least 58,000 contracts awarded between fiscal year 2003 and 2010 that must still be reviewed and, and closed out. But I agree with you that the numbers are absolutely staggering. I would call upon the White House, please prioritize these IGs, get them nominated, and get the Senate over there to do their job so that we have three of the five that are unfulfilled. And uh, that's just inexcusable in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I yield back. Uh, we'll now recognize Mr. Towns, I believe, for five minutes. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me begin by saying it's very good to see my former colleague and, of course, um, I'm back and uh, see that he's doing well. And also to thank you, members of the Commission, for the outstanding work that you're doing. You know, um, there's people that will say that even though the recommendation of the IG is made uh, that the problem in terms of getting it funded, which will probably be around $21 million, uh, that will just not happen. But now, um, when I look and I read that the extent of fraud and abuse, and one stunning example, an inspector general found that the United States government paid $900 for a control switch that was worth only $7. In other cases, contractors were found overbuilding the government with markups ranging from 2,300 percent to 12,000 percent for goods and services. This is a course of action that cannot and must not continue. And I hope that this Congress, led by this committee, can accept the Commission's recommendations and put measures in place that are necessary to show Americans that the government can be better stewards of taxpayers. How do we make the case with those folks that are saying, now here you go again, you want to spend additional resources, you want to spend additional money? What do, what do we say to them? Well, we say to them, uh, you'll save a lot more than you'll spend. You just mentioned it yourself, sir. Uh, uh, we're talking about not just $900 items. We're talking about fraud with uh, uh, payments to protection payments and protection rackets in Afghanistan uh, that uh, some estimates put over $350 million. Our, our report documents case after case of uh, projects that are in the millions, sometimes in the billions. Uh, if you weigh, on the one hand, the uh, small amounts of money you're talking about, say the $21 million you mentioned, against these huge amounts, uh, it's kind of a no-brainer. Mr. Towns, the, uh, Congressman Towns, uh, Commissioner Tiefer spent a lot of time on Chapter 3. Chapter 3, uh, it deals with the inattention to contingency contracting leads to massive waste, fraud, and abuse. Our problem with Mr. Tiefer was that this book would have been three times as thick if we let him put in everything he wanted to put in. So we limited him to 40 cases, uh, but um, it could have been many more. You read that and you don't go through the argument that you're, you're, you're presenting. Yes, Commissioner. I, yes, I would, if I could just add to that too, this is a perfect time to be making these sorts of investments because as we are looking at um, particularly in the Department of Defense, but also the State Department and USAID, how they can best position themselves for the future with fewer resources. 
one way to this, – this is the perfect time to say we can make investments, we can reallocate some of our resources to try and prevent this waste, to try and get a better return on the investment we make and the taxpayer dollars we spend. So I would argue this is the time to be making these sorts of, of resource allocation decisions. Congressman Towns, let, let me I, – I thank uh, the Chairman for his kind remarks, and I, I, I assure him that his editing improved the product, uh, that uh, the, the good stuff is in our report. But let me give you an example uh, of where if we had the personnel, if we had a limited amount of money for more personnel, we could save a lot of money. Uh, we have giant contracts that come to an end. Uh, and we should, we should compete them right then. Uh, we had a food service contract that came to an end, and because we didn't have the personnel to move fast enough to compete now, that got extended on a sole source basis, a $4 billion extension on a sole source basis, because the agency just wasn't ready to compete it at that point. Interesting. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I see my time has expired. So. The gentleman yields Bye. back. We will now recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Langford, for five minutes. Thank you, all of you, for the long work and the tedious work that I am sure you have done through a lot of uh, wonderful conversations. There is a, a section you have in Chapter 7 that is very interesting to me, dealing with the complexity of suspensions and debarment. I don't know who was the one that focused in on that information, but I would like to get a chance to talk about that and how we can resolve that. A couple of questions I had initially on it is when you are dealing with the complexity of suspension and debarment, are you dealing specifically with foreign contractors, U.S. contractors, or both on it? Uh, we are dealing with both, but our, we did not deal with domestic non-war contractors. We wanted strong reforms, but for overseas contracting. Uh, techniques that, that reduce the amount of procedure, but we did not, we were not trying to impose them on domestic uh, non-wartime contractors. Okay. Did you come up with recommendations out of this? Obviously, reading through this, this brief report that goes to that section on suspension and debarment, recommendations on how to be able to resolve that, because that, obviously that is not just an issue we deal with in contingency operations. That is something we deal with government-wide is the suspension and debarment issues that we have on how often they are used, the complexity of the process. Are there recommendations that are coming out of this as well? Uh, there are. There are several. Um, I will name one, um, which was that uh, in appropriate cases it should be possible to suspend and debar on a documentary record without holding a sort of a mini-trial as is, is required domestically. Uh, we have seen instances where it is almost impossible to pull together witnesses from Afghanistan to do a suspension trial. Just to elaborate a, a spec on that, when I served on, with your permission, sir? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, when I served on this committee, committee, I was stunned by the, the rights that we give contractors when they work with the government. Uh, and when, even when we overpay, it may take us a year to adjust it to, un, to, to pay them what they should be paid. If a private business wants to engage a contractor, they are limited by the contract, but they don't have any privileges before then. We give privileges before a contract, we give privileges during a contract, we give privileges after a contract. This committee needs to examine, in times of war, should we be giving contractors so many rights and privileges uh, that can drag out the decision for a year? And so what the government agencies decide to do is say, it's not worth waiting a year to resolve it, we'll just keep them. Okay. Did you run into situations where um it was a sole source, and uh, you would see a need for suspension or debarment, but instead of actually debarring them, they would say they are essential, we can't function without them, and so we know they are a bad actor, but we don't have any other folks that can help us. Countless times. Okay. How do we get around that? Is that a matter of uh, we don't have enough competition in those areas, we are not raising up, or is that something inherently governmental that we are trying to outsource into contracting and now we are running into problems? Could I start there, Ms. Spen I think it is all those things. It is, as I said earlier, the lack of organic capacity, so we don't have any alternative but to use contractors. Two, there is limited competition among contractors. Three, there is very limited oversight capacity on the part of the government, DCAA, GAO, the inspectors general, et cetera. So that is why these recommendations in our report are all of a piece. It is a package. It is important to put all these things together in order to solve the problem, it seems to us. Okay. Other comments on that? Because I have one other issue. Go ahead. Mr. Well, let me just comment. add. Oh, go ahead, Bob. One comment, Mr. Langford. 
You, you remember uh, perhaps the September 2009 incident at the Kabul embassy with the contractors partying, drinking, having a, having a, a great time and embarrassing the nation. Uh, they were providing security at the embassy. That contractor, because State didn't have the option of saying, go home tomorrow, we are bringing in our own people to provide security, that contractor stayed there for, I think, better, more than 18 months after that incident still in place, still billing the government, still operating, right. uh, and that's unacceptable. But have they been debarred since then? I mean, that becomes a, a different issue. They are fulfilling the rest of that contract, which has a whole different set of issues. But was there a process in place to say, yes, we are debarring them and there is no future contract? I do not believe State pursued that. And, in okay. fact, I believe the contractor, uh, this was a low-bid contract because State is required, strangely enough, by law, to have low bid contracts for security at embassies. That doesn't make any sense. Let, let, me, let me make one other quick comment here. You have an extensive section here on foreign contractors using human trafficking. Obviously, that, that's, a, that's a very stark comment that some of the work that is happening in Iraq, Iraq and Afghanistan is basically done with slave labor or people compelled to be able to work in this for whatever amount that is done. How extensive do you think that is? What uh, we understand is, uh, is that it is really quite extensive. Um, because what they do is they bring people in, um, hold on to their passports, and essentially lock them up as prisoners. It, it's, it's virtually slave labor. And we are aware of that. And you say the United States government, the people on the ground are aware of that, either after <laughs> the fact, after it is over, or during the process. Look, at a minimum, everybody is aware of it now after our report. And, of course, a lot of people were aware of it before our report. And, again, to get to the point about suspension and debarment, what are we going to do? Bring witnesses in from these right. companies? What we have to do is use the rules that are available to us, modify them slightly, and suspend these people. They are not even Americans, for God's sake. Right. All right. Thank you. For that. I, back. I would just say that if we had had more time, I think we would have gotten into the trafficking issue, because I think, I think there is a lot more to this story than, than any of us have confronted. Thank you. Now I recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I mean, we could be here the rest of the day or the week on this. I mean, you did a great job, and that's what we asked you to do. Uh, I'll, I'll make a number of points here and then uh, ask some questions as well. But the first and foremost, uh, Mr. Irwin, uh, thank you for continuing the argument on the Special Inspector General for Continuity Operations, because I'm trying to convince my friend, the Chairman here, that his name would be of value as a, as a sponsor on that bill. And, and I wanted to add to the point, besides the, the matter that this person would be able to cross different agencies, and, and they do overlap, and that's essential. The other thing that I think is lessons learned. We failed to learn the lessons of Iraq when we set up a whole different body over in Afghanistan. They had to start from scratch. They took nothing of the lessons learned from Iraq over. A contingency inspector general would be able at the outset to go in there with that knowledge those lessons learned would have, in fact, a whole repository of them uh, maintained and be able to go in from the outset. And I think that's important, don't you? I completely agree with that. I completely agree with that, sir. That person would be in place right at the outset, needless to say. And, I, and I, I think if somebody that was going in there was smart, they would use them for the advice on how to set up, not just wait for them to start overseeing immediately on that. Second point, Mr. Hamke, you make a great point about the organizational restructuring that needs to happen within the Department of Defense and State and all those. And, and I think part of that means giving value to those positions. You know, people go into those departments thinking like, ah, geez, it's, it's bookkeeping, it's accounting, it's overseeing. We have got to find a way for those agencies to give it value to be in that position, because if they are going to save us the kind of money they are, it has value in more sense than just a dollar. It is an important position to have. So um, we are going to be looking to your work on that to try to see how we can work with the departments and, and change that factor. Uh, overriding on that is, you know, if we try to do too much, as, as Congressman Shea said, and if we can't man, we have enough people there to man it, and we don't have enough resources even to manage or oversee it, maybe we ought to rethink the mission. And I think that is a lot of what is going on here. You know, whether we should be there or not, or be there in the way that we are, ought to somehow be dictated on what our capacity is and to do it well and to do it right. Um, the accountability aspect on it, we ran into this, Mr. Langford, on, on the Watan risk management uh, that you know, Mr. Chaffetz and I were dealing with just the other day, that you know, we recommended debarment. As a result of our investigation, the Department of Defense told us they were, they were going to do that, and off they went. And then we find out only at the second hearing, Mr. Chavis had, well, not so much. I mean, they basically let Watton off with a slap of the wrist by saying they couldn't do trucking contracts. And, well, they weren't doing them anymore anyway. And Rahatullah, who is the warlord, he just got off on some flimsy notion that he didn't understand what people were talking about when the investigation went on. But the Department never went in and held its own investigation and went on. So we have a lot of work 
to do in that area to make sure that there is accountability and competition, and the, the whole notion of the food and oil and the lack of competition there, and the problem with contracting itself, the idea that we haven't done a good job legally of getting contracts that are meaningful. When you can have a situation, as we did in the trucking uh, matter, where there was no insight, no vision into the subcontracting. They basically contracted to a bunch of middlemen who didn't even own trucks or security agents and left it up to them to subcontract to truckers and security, and we didn't retain the right to look at those subcontractors and to get any information with respect to them. That is a notion that you are very helpful in pointing out and, and going on that. So thank you and kudos for all of those different areas. My question to you is on sustainability. What does Congress have to do to make sure that we don't invest in projects in contingency areas that can't be sustained by the host government? I will start on that, um, Congressman, because it relates to your point on the mission. If we can't do it, maybe we shouldn't be doing it. And sustainability was important enough to us. It is a chapter in this report, but we also have an entirely separate special report on that. In that, we make a recommendation that you should be canceling projects that are not going to be sustainable. That is something that can happen right now. We have recommended that you go in and you evaluate the projects that we are putting money into now and that you cancel those that you cannot guarantee guarantee sustainability for. That is a short-term, immediate, dollar value um, uh, task, I think, that the agencies can take on. We also recommended, and this is, I think, very central to your concerns, uh, annual reports about the whole contingency contracting area. And that would give you a vehicle for double-checking on sustainability. In other words, if for some reason a project got started and it slipped past, you could catch them you have an opportunity every single year to catch them. Thank you. Mr. Tier uh, Congressman yes. Tierney, what is stunning to us is that the, the number of waste that we have determined, 30 to 60 billion, and many of us think it is close to 60 billion, we do think the non-sustainability question will clearly equal the 30 billion plus. So, uh, and it is just a whole no another amount that you would need to add to, to our waste figure, and it is a very real figure. Could I just respond to your, the special ID effort that sure. you are making? Uh, in support of the Chavez Special IG Act of 2011, um, Mr. Chairman, you, you are in the best position to see this because you know sometimes the Armed Service Committee, because of the relationship they have, with the military isn't looking at things they need to look at. You know sometimes the International uh, the Foreign Affairs Committee of Congress sometimes isn't going to get at something you know you need to look at because of the relation they have. The IGs that work in the departments develop relationships. There are certain things they are willing to do and there are certain things they are not willing to do unless you are someone like Mr. Irvin who didn't care what they thought. But a lot of them, it's a club. A lot of them don't want to offend the department they're in. And that's why you sometimes need the competition. And I'll just end by making this point. I remember when I was chairing this committee, uh, we didn't look at something I wanted to look at. My staff didn't want to look at it. And then the armed services looked at it, and it was a huge issue. And thank goodness they looked at it. And sometimes we looked at issues they didn't look at. So, um, you know, I just think that the chairman uh, is in the best position to see the value of this. And they are all pretty busy. Let's face it. The Department of Defense Inspector General, the State Inspector General, the USAID Inspector General, they have got a full plate, right. you know, without even contingency operations. They are just going to full plate all the time with the amount of money that they are in charge. Are you going to contingency operations? It is like a whole different ball game, and, and it works. It is an add-on. Mr. Chairman, can I chime in on sure. that? You know, what, one of the things we learned in our work State Department set up, I think in 2005 or six, a Middle East regional office, Miro they called it, to do audit work overseas. They had such, such a demand for it. So they set it up late, and two or three years later, they did a review to see how their audit quality was, and it wasn't good, and they had to stand it down. So they don't flex well to new, unique circumstances. Mr. Thank Chairman, your indulgence has been great. If I, I have one last comment to make on that, sure. and uh, besides my dying gratitude for the work that the, the commissioners have done, this committee perhaps ought to consider, and our subcommittee in particular, uh, using our members well. That maybe each one would want to tackle some of the recommendations, one or more of the recommendations, to see how we, uh, if we need to translate that into legislation, and how we do that, and if we need to just do follow-up with the agencies, and how we do that, so that this is not one product that just sits on the shelf. 
I mean, I think it's too valuable. I think the work was, uh, was too good for us, and it fits so squarely in the overarching part of this, and it gives us all something as a nonpartisan that we can work on together uh, that I think would be a great notion and a great example for Congress. So I, I just ask that you entertain that thought. And again, thank you all. Very good. Thank you. Uh, now I recognize the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Wahlberg, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thanks uh, as well to the Commission for the grim work you were asked to do and that you did do. Uh, and we trust that it will indeed have uh, uh, beneficial outcomes uh, as, as we tackle it. Um, along with the, uh, uh, the costs and the problems with the contracts, while they are uh, in operation, uh, the GAO just released a report in September uh, documenting that at least 58,000 contracts awarded between fiscal year 2003 and 2010 still need to be reviewed and closed out. Um, delays in the contract closeouts potentially waste, in fact, not potentially, but they do waste millions of dollars as improper payments, waste, fraud, and et cetera, become difficult or almost impossible to detect and recoup. Uh, this is because files are lost, memories fade, and contractors disappear in the contingency zone. Uh, let me ask this question, Commissioner Zakheim. Um, how important are timely contract closeouts to prevent waste, fraud, and abuse? Well, obviously, they are extremely important. If you don't close out a contract, for a start, uh, you can still, in theory at least, and in practice for most of the time, spend money. And that money probably should not be spent. It is taxpayer money. And it is probably going in the wrong way to the wrong people. And we have seen cases, for example, where contractors are using their people maybe one-fifth of the time and being paid full-time, again, because it takes so long to close out. So when you look at thousands upon thousands of contracts that have not been closed out, which means they haven't been properly audited, by the way. So no oversight or anything that's going on? Well, that's yeah. exactly right. And that's what uh, Commissioner Shea said a little bit earlier. Uh, if you are not auditing a contract for years, and the government is actually paying the, for the time in between the audit actually having to take place, the taxpayer is being hit with a double whammy. In the first place, they may have been overcharged, and in the second place, they are then paying for the time that is not being covered because the audit hasn't been done. That is just ridiculous. Yeah. Congressman Shays, uh, you know, based on that, and, and good to see you again. Nice to see you. Thank you. What steps should uh, DCAA and, and DOD be taking to accelerate this process? Um, I may not be the best one in the Commission to answer that question, but let me just say, first, honesty. Uh, just look at the numbers. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and also, I need to say that Congress needs to uh, share in this burden. Uh, this isn't just the administration. Uh, Congress needs to be advocating uh, that these positions be filled. Who would you suggest would be the best one to answer this, and the, would they well, answer? Well, I'll, I'll take that one on again because DCAA okay. was under me, sir. Um, as I, uh, I would just emphasize the need to hire more DCAA people, more auditors. If you don't have auditors, you don't do audits. It's as simple as that. It, it, sir, if it, I may contribute yes, to that as well, yes. we're not talking about thousands of people. DCAA is scrapping to get a hundred people, a hundred auditors added next year and then 100 auditors added in 2013 to attack this work, uh, this, this backlog of work. Maybe one of the things the committee could look at is uh, making that entity uh, funded on a fee basis instead of a discretionary appropriation so that they are able to scale up and uh, perform the work that they are being asked to, asked to do. Congressman Wahlberg, let me add, and um, it's, um, it's uh, Commissioner Tebow, um, who was deputy at DCAA, worked very hard on the specifics of the personnel and the shortfall of the personnel and the scale of the unaudited contracts. Um, what we found was that DCAA was responding to necessary priorities. They are short on personnel, and they had a choice between auditing the backlog, uh, which they or um, handling their real-time responsibilities, such as when a new uh, bi billion-dollar or multi-billion-dollar contract is awarded, they are supposed to audit the proposals to see that the contract that is issued is right. So they, in effect, uh, sacrificed letting the backlog grow and grow 
Uh, and that is how it grew and grew. They met their current but not their old uh, needs. Thank you. Let me ask one final question. Uh, Representative Shays, is, is the Obama administration aware of this problem? Oh, I think so. And I, and I hope Congress is as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We are now going to recognize the gentleman from Virginia, uh, Mr. Conley, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, one of the things I find interesting in this whole discussion is that Congress almost never takes responsibility for the, our contribution to the problem. Um, Mr. Shays, when you were in Congress, we had leadership, especially in the Armed Services Committee at the time, that actually poo pooed the idea of the need for more expertise in hiring of contract managers' procurement and acquisition expertise. And as a result, we quadrupled outside contracting, but increased contracting personnel by only 3 percent, the Federal Government. And now we are surprised that we can't account for all of the dollars we have appropriated. Um, and what I hear, anyone disagree, but I think I heard unanimity that one of the answers was we need more capability at DCA and in auditing functions to be able to account for the dollars we are appropriating. Anyone disagree with that? No, but I think one reason why this Commission was able to be so bipartisan is we realized the fault lay with both parties and uh, all the branches. Because we have had a rather mindless dialogue sometimes here in this Congress about the need to shrink the size of Federal Government, and we never talk about the need to invest, actually, for a substantial payoff down the road. Obviously, if we could have saved the 31 to $60 billion you estimate has been wasted, either due to fraud or loss somehow, um, whatever we invested in additional personnel would have been more than returned back. Um, and I assume that is in part your testimony as well, that those Rel relatively modest investments up front would have big payoff in helping to deter what you, your report so ably documents, sadly, uh, in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Mr. Zakam. Well, uh, I can't disagree with you. Uh, part of the problem is that we are going to have to play catch-up ball. Uh, as Commissioner Shays just said, uh, the blame lies everywhere. It started in the 1990s when uh, we were having a so-called peace dividend, and, and it turned out that a chunk of that dividend was to cut the very people you are just talking about. So there is some blame there. There is blame later on as, uh, in the early part of this decade when large contracts were let and were not definitized properly. And, and we, one could go on and on. I think the point of, of, of our Commission report, and I think what, where we all agree, regardless of our politics, is that there is something that needs to be done. It needs to be done now. It needs to be done in the interest of this country and its taxpayers. And politics don't enter into it. Uh, well, of course, politics actually do enter into it when you decide on a budget uh, and what investments you will or will not make. I wish politics didn't enter into it, but they very much do. I would be glad to bring you to the floor of the House and you could watch some of our debates. Um, and uh, we are often we seem to know the cost of everything and the value of nothing around here. Um, let me ask, the estimate of loss is $31 to $60 billion. That is a pretty wide array. Why such a wide array in your report? And, and second point, and then I will shut up, what, how, how much would you attribute that to lost money indigenously, where you are hiring local trucking companies and convoys and they just off with the cargo or lose the fuel or whatever it may be? I think that one might fall to me. Uh, first of all, we, have, we applied a very broad definition of, of waste, uh, really to look at opportunity cost, how much money you could have spent on other things. And we include in our definition uh, excessive requirements that weren't uh, adjusted afterwards. We include rework that was required on poorly done jobs. We include uh, poor projects that didn't fit the local cultures or the local politics. We include unanticipated security costs. In other words, you, you have a contract and all of a sudden you discover you've got a higher security because it's a dangerous area. We include questionable payments to contractors and we include poor oversight. And uh, as uh, was mentioned earlier, we don't include sustainment costs. Now, why such a wide range? Well, you can't really do a bottom-up 
uh, study of this because we simply don't have enough information on all these contracts. Look, you heard 58,000 of them haven't even been finalized yet. Uh, so we just don't have enough information to build a bottom-up uh, number, although, as was mentioned, uh, and Commissioner Tiefer led on this, we sure found an awful lot of examples that are in Chapter 3. Uh, we couldn't, a a top-down estimate is insufficient. Uh, if you really want to do a proper parametric estimate, and our number really is kind of, we say 10 to 20 percent of that $206 billion, but if you really wanted to have all the parameters, you simply couldn't do it, again, because that would not capture the individual projects. So top down doesn't do it, bottom up doesn't do it. And fraud, that part, which is based on, uh, on another estimate by the uh, certified fraud examiners, which is for the civilian side, that's 7 percent, we assume 5 to 9 percent, that one doesn't work either precisely for, because of the point you made. We don't know how much has been siphoned off by all these crooks. Uh, it's just hard to get to, and it goes to uh, something that the Commission is very concerned about, visibility over subcontracts. Those are the guys who are actually paying these crooks off. And uh, you probably saw on page, I think it is 73 of our report, we actually show a bill that Commissioner Shays and I were given a copy of when we were in Afghanistan. And these are a bunch of crooks, insurgents, saying, well, if you want protection, here's the number to call. I mean, it's something like out of HBO. If I can add briefly, um, one of the things that extended the array of waste was the change from Iraq to Afghanistan. Uh, in 2008, when you set us up and sent us out, um, Iraq was the big contracting problem. Now Afghanistan, well, the problems are quite different. You have payoffs for protection to insurgents in Afghanistan. Mr. Tierney, Mr. Chaffetz have been looking at that. They, they led the way. That wasn't a problem back there in Iraq. You have an, a country that is so poor in Afghanistan that it has very little absorptive capability, which means they can't sustain what we are building when we are gone. Iraq wasn't poor in the way Afghanistan is poor. So we have a whole new set of problems. Thank you. Now I recognize the gentleman from Idaho, Mr. Labrador, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Congressman Shays, I, I found your comment to be fascinating, and I want to explore it a little bit. And then, um, we are doing too much. You said that the one thing, the, the one uh, recommendation you have is that we are doing too much. Could, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, it, it's, the genesis is really a dialogue that took place uh, among the members. At, at first, we thought, we just got to manage these contractors better. And if we manage them better, we won't have waste. And then we realized that uh, it was more than that, that um, if we couldn't manage them better, maybe we shouldn't do as much because we can't manage them. And then we began to realize, my gosh, even if you can manage them, uh, we began to just see so many things happening. I mean, when, when, you, when you have a wonderful contract in Afghanistan that costs, you know, $18 million, uh, doing, uh, fitting their culture, doing agriculture work, and all of a sudden the federal government decides they're going to increase the program to $350 million instead of 18 or whatever it was, um, but much less than the 350, and then they got to finish it by the fiscal year to start to spend. That's crazy, and we just saw it time and time again. We simply think we just got beyond our capability to manage, and frankly, we even went farther than that. Because I agree with you, I, I had the opportunity to be in Iraq and Afghanistan um, earlier this year. It, I'm, I'm a freshman member, and, and it was eye-opening to see what we're doing, what we're trying to accomplish there, and just all the money that we're wasting. It, it was sad. And I can see why you're angry, and I assume every member of this panel is angry, because this is not just we're mismanaging. It, this is that we are wasting the money of the American people. And I'm frustrated, and I get frustrated when I hear, especially from some members of it on my side of the aisle, that we can't do anything about fraud, waste, and abuse in the military. We should look at all the other areas, but we can't do it in, in the military. And, and I, I, it just blows my mind. So any of the recommendations that you gave in this report, do they address this particular issue? Because I think that's what I'm more concerned about, because I read these 25 recommendations, and what I see is better management. And I don't think we can manage 
because I agree with you, we are doing too much. Which of the specific recommendations do you think hits at the heart of your concern? Well, I will answer it this way. Uh, one of the answers, uh, we, we, in a sense, everybody takes the blame. The problem is if everybody takes the blame, nobody is responsible. We have tried in our report to start to have people accountable. So the dual-headed person that would actually have to be approved by the Senate but would be, have a right to make decisions in the NSC and also at OMB, uh, that person right at the top would have to answer about the waste and all the money being spent. Having a J-10, somebody within the Joint Chiefs that is focused on all the contracting, and when contracting doesn't turn out right, they're going to go right to that J-10. Having the key management uh, positions that we advocate uh, in state and, and in defense uh, and USAID, that person in charge of this, then they're going to feel a little responsible for saying, you know what, I think we're doing too much, I think we're wasting money, and it's going to fall on my desk, and I'm going to have to take the hit. I think they're going to start to force some accountability. So your hope is that these people say we're doing too much, but it seems like we're doing nothing, at least at our, on our side, uh, and I might mean you know, both Republicans and Democrats, we are doing nothing to, to tell maybe the military or, or other agencies that we are doing too much in, in these areas. Do you have any specific well, recommendations? One of, one of the values of this committee, again, is that I think this committee is a little more willing to look at DOD in a fresh way mm -hmm. uh, and say, you know, you are also part of the mix. So um, not, you, not quite addressing the answer, but I, I see that, that um, my colleague, Mr. Irvin. If I could just add one, one thing to this that I think might be helpful, sir. I think our present fiscal um, situation is actually, as dire as it is, helpful in this regard. The fiscal situation the country finds it sent itself in today is, needless to say, very different from the way it was 10 years ago. We simply cannot afford to undertake the range of missions now that we could 10 years ago. So I think this kind of question, whether we should engage in it at all, whether it is contractors or organically oversight or not, uh, will be preceded necessarily so by a question of whether we should undertake it at all, given the state of our finances now. You know, and I agree with you, and thank you for, for your answers. Thank you for your work. Thank you for being here. I just wish I, I would see that more in, in members of this Congress. I, I still see too many members of this Congress saying that we, we need to give the military a pass when we get reports like yours, and I can see how we can actually make a huge difference by making very small changes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. I will now recognize the gentleman from Vermont, Vermont Mr. Welch. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for your good work on this, and I really appreciate the cooperation that you and Mr. Tierney, your predecessor, have shown on this uh, in the remarks of my colleagues. Uh, and, of course, Mr. Shays, uh, welcome to you and to all the contractors. Uh, two things. You have done a great job, and it is so refreshing to have, like, content you know, that we can put our arms around and find common ground to hopefully get something done, because most of us uh, would prefer to get something constructive done, and you have really established a platform. Uh, I just want to make one general comment and then uh, ask a few specific questions. The general comment, I think, is that if we assign this huge job, like the war in Iraq or war in Afghanistan, to the military, and they have limited resources, uh, contracting allows the illusion uh, that there is a capacity that doesn't exist, because all we have to do is throw money at the problem. And obviously it doesn't work. So the real discipline has to be on what it is we expect, uh, uh, what, what assignment we impose on the military. And if we are unwilling to, uh, to, to, to address the capacity question that you have identified, then it is going to result in failure, no matter how much oversight we have. Uh, and the tyranny work that he did on getting that bottle of water uh, from here up through Pakistan, uh, through Afghanistan, journeys that you have taken many times, Mr. Shays, to that forward operating base or that bullet, and whatever has to be done by the military to get that bullet, to get that bottle of water to our soldier on that forward operating base they are going to do, and they will deal with uh, all the chaos and all of the mismanagement and all the wasted money afterwards. Understandable, but that is our problem. So thank you so much for focusing on that. But on a couple of specific questions coming up, as you know, uh, we are going to be uh, transitioning, we are transitioning in Iraq. 
And among the tasks that we are going to be asking the State Department now to do are activities traditionally done by the military and certainly seen, I think, by most of us traditionally as a governmental functions. Uh, they will be serving as a quick reaction force to rescue hostages or to respond to attacks on the road. Uh, I will ask you, Mr. Henke, does the OMB guidance apply to the State Department and its contractors? Uh, yes, sir, it, it, it does. The devil, of course, is in the details of how they interpret the words in the OMB guidance. The short answer is um, the question now becomes what do agencies do with that guidance? They have now put security in a combat zone on the list. Now, State will perhaps argue to you, A, we don't do combat, and B, we don't support DOD who does combat. We are a separate agency. That is all well and good, but I think that leads to the conclusion that State would offer is that the embassy in Kabul is like any other embassy anywhere and can be provided by, can be guarded by contractors. Yes, it is more high risk, but it is still appropriate. OMB guidance would disagree with them. But what about like a, a hostage rescue team? Would that be an activity that is inherently a governmental function? It, it, if you are going to rescue people who are yeah. engaged in combat, you Yes, sir, that is correct. Yeah. And then what about convoy security through insur uh, insurgent controlled territory in Afghanistan? Uh, would that be appropriate for contractors under the new uh, OMB guidance? Uh, well, the, the words in the guidance are this security operations, this is on the list of inherently governmental, security operations performed in direct support of combat as part of a larger integrated armed force. So those convoys are providing military articles and military goods. It seems to me they are in direct support of combat operations. Okay. Well, I want to thank each and every one of you. And, uh, could, could, Mr. Mr. could I just uh, make sure, sure Mr. Chase? Yes, go ahead. Because one thing is getting lost that we don't want to get lost. Inherently governmental means the government should do it. If it is not inherently governmental, it doesn't mean the government shouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. There are, and our whole point in our chapter is that we look at risk. And if the risk is high, even if it's quote unquote not inherently governmental, but the risk is high, uh, we would be leaning towards suggesting that a government, that the government do it. What is very uh, disconcerting about Ambassador Kennedy's response, basically DOD is leaving Iraq. They are transferring their responsibilities to state and state is now saying we are doing it, but it is not inherently governmental. They are literally saying that. We fear that they are saying it because they don't want to appear like they are not abiding by the law. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank all of you. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to being a lieutenant for you and the ranking member. Uh, we have got a good issue here, good committee to work on it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Welch. Appreciate it. We will now recognize the former chairman of this committee, a gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Burton, for five minutes. Chris, good seeing you again, buddy. Great to see you. Wish you were back. Uh, I just have one question, and any one of you can answer that. Uh, and I, I don't want to be redundant. You may have answered this before, and I was at a Foreign Affairs Committee meeting, so I apologize. Uh, you said that there ought to be some kind of a commissioner to oversee these, uh, these issues. And it seems to me, and I know Mr. Tierney had a, has a bill dealing with that, it seems to me that there is a, a that, that, that just seems like another layer of bureaucracy that we would have to deal with. If, if the, um, uh, the people who are supposed to review these contracts and watch over waste, fraud, and abuse, if there is a buddy-buddy relationship, as you say there is, it seems to me that we ought to uh, uh, get rid of them and uh, replace them with somebody that is not, uh, that's not uh, uh, biased in any way. But to come up with another layer of bureaucracy to oversee the ones who may be buddy buddy with the contractors uh, just doesn't make sense, especially at a time when we have these fiscal problems. I know we're not talking about a lot of money, but these things have a way of mushrooming. So uh, I'd just like to get your comment on that. And, it, and if, if our committee on government reform and oversight, if we had commissioners like you that talked about specific problems with a an agency where they are not policing it properly, we could make the uh, request that that person be replaced so that there wouldn't be the buddy, buddy relationship that you are talking about. But I would just like to get your comments one more, once more on 
whether or not we ought to have this new layer of, of, of bureaucracy or a new commissioner to oversee all this. Right. Congressman Burton, I will take a shot at that, if sure. I may. Um, I think what um, uh, Commissioner Shays was referring to were the, were the individual IGs in the agencies as getting so, too close sometimes to the management of those agencies. No, I understand the, that. What we are talking about, um, but what we saw in the contingency operations is really their multi-agency flavor. It is not just one agency that is spending money. Uh, all across the government, I think there are 17 agencies who are spending money in Afghanistan right now. Mm -hmm. So what we are looking for in the Special Inspector General is, is not another layer as much as an individual who has the authority to look across the different agencies. So we would replace the Special Inspector General for Iraq. We would replace the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan. Those offices have done some good work that the individual agencies were not able to do okay. because they didn't have the authority. So it really is meant to be a, a, a sort of an efficient way to look at the money that the U.S. government as a whole is spending in these contingencies. Mr. Chairman, that's the only question I had. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I will now recognize the, the gentleman uh, from Illinois, Mr. Davis, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, Congressman Hayes, it's, Shays, it is always good to see you, and it is good to know that you are still involved in public interest and public service activity. I want to thank you and all of the other members of the Commission for the tremendous work I think you have done. Uh, looking at this report sort of affirms for me a lot of things that I had thought <laughs> but didn't necessarily have the information or the data to go on. I mean, I, I thought it, and then when I read it, I am saying, yeah, that is kind of the way it is. That is how difficult it is. As a matter of fact, uh, I thought of in some societies, in some communities, in some neighborhoods, in different places throughout the world, there is a saying that if you find a sucker, bump his head, you know, that that that's just sort of <laughs> the way the culture evolves. And it seems to me that there are a lot of people in these countries who become involved in one way or the other who kind of see this as an opportunity to feed from the trough. And if there is an opportunity, they just can't resist. I, I mean, they just can't not do it. And, and so my question sort of becomes, I guess whether or not this is almost seen as policy that we hire, especially if we are in different countries and we have war taking place, do we hire all of these contractors as a way of, of kind of mollifying to some degree some of the elements that might be there that just makes it possible or more possible that we can function and operate. Uh, Commissioner, you. Yeah. Um, well, we do have policies as you describe them. They are called Iraqi first and Afghanistan first and you want to hire locals. The problem is twofold. The first is, it is one thing to hire locals, it is another thing to flood a country with money. And uh, my colleague, Commissioner Tiefer, mentioned that. When you are when you're putting as much money into uh, Afghanistan, or virtually as much as its entire gross domestic product, and six times as much as its uh, budget, then you have got a problem. I mean, that, there's money coming off of trees, as far as the Afghans are concerned. So lesson number one is, maybe you should look much more carefully at how much a country can absorb before you start pouring the money in. Lesson number two is if you are going to have local contractors and you are going to have them because you have a policy that you want to at least have people not alienated by your presence, then for God's sake supervise them. And that is what we have re re uh, recommended in, in our re uh, Commission report, that in, in whatever the circumstances in, in the United States or elsewhere in peacetime, when you are involved in a contingency and you are using local subcontractors, the United States government should be able to look at their books. And if their books aren't clean, we throw them out. 
Yes. Mr. Davis, this is what, Mr. what Commissioner Zakheim said was exactly right about the Afghan contractors and the Iraqi contractors. Uh, I would say you find in our report recommendations to have stronger controls over foreign contractors, in part because the Kuwaiti contractors, we depended upon them for the Iraq war, and they took us to the cleaners. They built from little business. It should have been American business. If someone was going to grow in wartime, at least it could have been an American business. S relatively small Kuwaiti businesses grew to large size. Public Warehousing Corporation, which currently has an indictment where the press has estimated to settle that case would cost them $750 million. Uh, first, Kuwaiti, which built the Baghdad Embassy, which has an unpaid bill, according to the Inspector General, of $124 million. The Kuwaitis took us to the cleaners. Yes, and our report, to, to uh, augment that, I, I would say we want the ability to look at all foreign subcontracts, not just the ones in theater, which is what you are referring to, but Kuwaitis or anybody else, anybody who is doing business with the United States ought to be auditable. Tough job. I thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. I will now recognize Mr. Murphy for five minutes, uh, of Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, and uh, let me uh, add my thanks to uh, Congressman Shays, uh, one for uh, your long service to our state of Connecticut, uh, but also for your great work on this committee. I know how seriously you took this work, uh, and I think we're all incredibly pleased, as Mr. Welsh said, to see uh, some real concrete proposals before us. Um, it's not often uh, that this committee gets to see this, this kind of volume of uh, good forward-looking work. Um, I want to build on Representative Tierney's questions about sustainability, because I think this is key, and I am so glad that you have focused in on this issue. But your suggestion, in some ways, is a pretty radical suggestion, uh, because your first bullet point says essentially what you have already repeated, that we should examine completed and current projects for risk of sustainment failure and take appropriate action to cancel or redesign these programs. Now, a couple pages earlier, you point out that just in the next year, we are going to spend $13 billion on building up security forces alone, and the total revenue coming into the Afghan government today is $2 billion, um, not enough to even cover one-sixth of the expense of the security investment alone. And though I think there is a lot of hope for some long-term new revenue sources related to mineral, mineral production, that is a real long-term pie-in-the-sky um, pr uh, prognosis. So um, I guess you know, my question is, what are, we really, what are you really recommending here? Because a suggestion that you cut off all programs that can't sustain themselves is perhaps a recommendation to stop funding the buildup of the Afghan national security forces. It is a prescription to essentially end support for a lot of the main core missions that we have been, we've been doing here. You note that the other side of this is to just admit that the American taxpayer is on the hook for a lot longer than we are. And that is the other side of this, um, is that you know, maybe we just have to have a clear understanding that we are going to be in to paying for uh, particular the security forces much longer than the American public may understand. But I guess I am trying to get my hands wrapped around how, how radical a, um, uh, a recommendation is the idea that we should end projects that aren't sustainable. Well, uh, why don't I start? I, I think your analysis is spot on, sir. Um, there is no question but that a lot of these projects, you talked about the security forces in particular, cannot be sus sustained absent continued American investment. And I think we have to be honest about that. We have a choice. Either the United States government continues to undertake these projects if we ultimately conclude that notwithstanding our fiscal situation, they are critical to the national security of the United States, or we determine that they are not critical to the United States government, it's national security, and we can't afford and therefore we have to stand down. You know, General Caldwell has already said that he's planning to ratchet back the cost of training the Afghan forces. That tells me that, when, again, when the government wants to respond, it can respond. Now, as Commissioner Irvin says, it's still going to cost us money. We might as well be honest about it. But at least if we focus much more carefully on these projects, 
and we decide that we, we do need them, as we need to train the Afghan forces, then we can cut these projects down to size. And that is exactly what General Caldwell is doing. I want to add my voice. It's, it is a tremendously insightful question. And um, uh, I think really what, what we are saying is, obviously, we can't just elim eliminate everything that we think they can not sustain, but we have to reduce uh, the amount or the size of projects to fit our capability to sustain them in the future. Let me just drill down in my remaining time to one specific issue you raised, which is with the SERP funds. Um, when I was in Afghanistan last, um, it was a, a particular point made by our commanders in the field how important these SERP funds were to them um, in terms of building out their support amongst the, uh, the community. But I think you raise a very important point that there is a very different analysis in whether it is important for the here and now of building local support and whether um, it can be sustained in the long run. Um, recommendations or ideas on how we better control the usage of SERP funds, because the, uh, this is going to be a, a major debate here, and I would be interested to see if there are specific recommendations to make sure that sustainability is part of the commander's decision-making process or part of the approval process. Sir, briefly, I would say I would recognize SERP for what it is, and I think it is an adaptation. It is DOD's willingness to say, we can do that. Just give us the resources to do it, even if it is not their core mission. Um, the, when SERP was originally brought about, it was on the order of $150, $180 million with seized Iraqi assets. No one thought that it would grow to be a $2 billion program where we are buying a generator complex in Kandahar for $240 million. So, number one, look at the capacity of the agencies who should be doing those things, diplomacy, development, missions. They have the mission. They don't have the money. State has the money, or DOD has the money and the ability to send forces to go to go do that. So, number one, look at the uh, look at the existing agency who might be doing that mission if they were uh, more fully uh, staffed, and um, and and don't let things like SERP get out of control. No one thought that it would be used to to be basically a de facto development program. A long way from hundred dollars for a door, three hundred dollars for a new well, to let's build a quarter billion dollar power plant in Kandahar. And if I might add to that, we spent um, a lot of time during one of our hearings pursuing just this question. And um, we asked the question of the different agencies, have you all come together to talk about, you know, the military timeline is today, today, today. Yep. The development timeline that they are trying to work on is much longer. The projects are totally out of sync. And we got no answer back from the agencies. Are you all working together to bring the knowledge to the resources, as, as Mr. Henke just said, that we need to to get done the mission. But SERP is clearly something that we found was one of those missions where you just throw more money at it and, and it will be fixed when that is clearly not the case. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Now I recognize the gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Maloney, for five minutes. Well, uh, thank you very much. And I, I want to thank all of the members of the panel who served on the Commission on Wartime Contracting, and especially my good uh, friend and former colleague, Christopher Shays. Uh, uh, just yesterday, the bill we worked on went into effect for the Victims' Compensation Fund for the 9-11 workers. Uh, I appreciate your tremendous uh, leadership. Uh, thank you for your service in so many areas. And I, I compliment you on this uh, report, and you make a number of recommendations, which I think are important. So many reports come back to us, and then they never say what you should do. But you, you, have, you are clear in uh, your recommendations to increase uh, competition. And in your written testimony, you decry the fact that even after eight years in Iraq, there are still multi-billion dollar contracts that have never been effectively recompeted. And you state uh, that you believe there is 30 to 60 billion dollars lost in contract uh, waste, fraud, and abuse. Uh, so uh, it seems like some of these uh, contractors are being treated like they're too big to fail. Well, in the Financial Services Committee, in which uh, Chris and I both served, we passed legislation to end too big to fail. It, it, we can't afford it in this country. We cannot afford bailouts. And uh, in your report, it almost sounds like a bailout or a gift to give a sole source huge contract for items that are easy to produce and get to the troops, such as food, fuel, uh, logistical support, 
This isn't high tech, uh, high, high difficult things. These are things that I think many of my constituents in New York and probably yours, Christopher, former ones in Connecticut, would like the opportunity to bid on the opportunity to provide these services. So my question is, you have some recommendations. Mr. Chairman, let's start implementing. Let's re-bid some of these contracts and see if we can lower the cost for the American taxpayer. Uh, in the city of New York, uh, we found in our studies that there were sole source contracts. And when we bid them competitively to the lowest responsible bidder, you had to have a record, you have to be doing it well, it saved literally hundreds of billions of dollars in the city of New York. So I think that in the federal government, where it says that you are sending, spending $200 billion in, in contracts alone in logistics, uh, that we could save a lot of money. And this is within the jurisdiction of this committee. And uh, my question to, uh, to you, uh, uh, Mr. Shays, is there any uh, understanding of, of how much this would save in taxpayers' money if we were able to uh, com competitively bid them, and bid them now? And when they expire for, for food, for fuel, how difficult is it? I mean, we have people moving food and fuel all over the country. Uh, why not let the taxpayers, other taxpayers, have a chance to bid and see if they can provide it at a lower price, uh, probably more efficiently and effectively? And I agree with your report that it's ridiculous to give these sole source contracts. Uh, once you get it, you, you, you have it for life. Uh, that's not the American way. And uh, particularly in, in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, we should be watching every dollar. I, I agree with Commissioner uh, Tyfer, who said these contracts should be going to an American companies. They should be providing these services and growing American jobs. Uh, but, but let's uh, put some competition in the system. So my question, uh, Commissioner Shea, is have you done any studies on, on what would happen if we competitively bid, oh, say, the delivery of fuel? Uh, it would probably bring down uh, the cost by billions. Um, being the wise man that I am, I'm going to ask the expert on this issue to respond to the question, Mr. Tiefer, who uh, will, I think, give you a good answer. Uh, thank you. And, and Ms. Maloney, that would be a good answer. <laughs> well, I'll start by saying uh, there's a great bipartisan tradition about competition on this, this committee. This is the committee that wrote the Competition and Contracting Act itself, which is still this, this um, here. The, 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 lo the lodestar, the central principle for competition. But they didn't use it in Iraq and Afghanistan. No, they found exceptions and they've gotten around it. Uh, so. But now I can see when you're going in in an emergency, but now uh, when we are looking to save dollars, uh, there is absolutely no reason why we can't rebid all of these contracts and uh, save taxpayers money. We, we used a figure uh, of 11 percent as the amount of money that would be saved because the Army had used that in its decision, which unfortunately went the wrong way, uh, about whether to give a sole source extension to the log cap contract in Iraq when, uh, for, for, its, for its last year. Um, among the among the particular things that concerned us, which are problem, loopholes in effect in the Competition and Contracting Act, um, is that the logistics contract in Afghanistan, the one that is held by only two companies, they have a five-year long contract. When you say logistics, does that include fuel and food? Um, when you say logistics, what it, is logistics? Um, it is not bulk commodities, but it is the dining halls, which is the, the, the preparation of the food, the, 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 uh, the providing of the food to the troops and the, the civilians. Um, so that is just providing the food. What about importing the food or buying the food? Is that part of it? Um, that is separate. There have been uh, scandals in, in the supplying of the bulk food. Um, that is that's where the 750 million dollar indictment of public warehousing was. There have been scandals in providing the fuel. That is the Kyrgyzstan scandal about how the, we made payoffs to the family of the, of the uh, corrupt ruler. Um, but the, the, um, the particular of the logistics contract, which is the single biggest contract, is that it won't be competed for, for an entire five years because the agency says it doesn't have the personnel to compete it in, in three years, which is absurd. Well, I, I agree it's absurd. And, and if they don't have the personnel to compete it, then I think this uh, committee could direct that personnel be uh, shifted over there so that we could uh, compete it. But are there other contracts 
that we could compete and see if there's savings. Um, and and uh, it's ridiculous to give a sole source in this situation. To add a perspective, what was most disconcerting for us was when you start the process, you're going to want to deal with one contractor, and you're not going to want to let out a lot of bits. But after you're into the second and third year, uh, then we wanted to see a lot more competition. So we have evolved where there is a lot more competition. It, the sole source is not the rule. It's the exception. But it seems to be the exception on the bigger dollar items, which uh, then you know, causes us concern, just to provide the perspective. But why don't we change that, Commissioner Shays? We can change that. This commission could, could uh, direct to competitively bid the larger contracts. I believe you would save money by the billions. I really do believe that. And we're in a financial crisis now. Well, we were concerned that they didn't go to log cap four soon enough, that they allowed it to continue in Iraq. We voiced our concern. We, uh, we don't have the clout that you all have. And you all um, can, can continue this uh, looking at what we've done, looking at what we recommended, looking what we argued for, looking where we've had success, seeing where we haven't yet. Well, well who stops it? Who stops it when you try to make these changes? Well, it's a DOD or state that basically says, you know, they're comfortable with this contract. And that's the bottom line. And we're at war, and uh, so be it. Thank, thank you. We're going to start a second round. If you want to come back, I'll recognize you again. But um, I'd like to recognize myself here for just a couple of follow-ups, and then I think we'll be pretty well close to, to, to the end here. Um, there is something dramatically wrong uh, particularly, it strikes me, at the Department of Defense. Uh, we've been doing this for a long time. Uh, we've talked about uh, don't want to offend people and they get too cozy in their relationships. And I just want to go a little bit deeper and having done this, Commissioner Irvin, maybe you can, you can start. What specifically do we need to do to get them to work? And I don't buy the answer that it's always just more money. Um, they have hundreds of billions of dollars at the Department of Defense. Perhaps they're not prioritizing that properly, but the numbers are absolutely staggering. What's, and I know you've got a whole report here, but for, the, for this uh, hearing, what else can we do to get these IGs to actually do what they're already charged to do? Right. Well, I guess I'd say a number of things. First of all, we need to fill the vacancies that exist with regard to the statutory IGs, as we discussed earlier, at yep. the State Department. Mm -hmm. And there will soon be a retirement, I understand, at AID, so we need yep. to fill that. Secondly, we need to make sure that those three statutory IGs are um, effectively resourced, that they have the necessary resources, money, so that they can hire not just the numbers of people, auditors, investigators, inspectors, but also the people with the requisite expertise. And I think this is another example where our present parlous economic state is actually helpful because there are lots of people out there who used to be employed by the private sector that aren't employed now that would do terrifically good jobs, it seems to me, in these positions. All that having been said, I still, we all still believe that it's critical that there also be complementarily a special inspector general position for a number of reasons, as we said before. That person would have interagency jurisdiction, which the statutory inspectors general do not. Uh, unlike the statutory inspectors general, that special inspector general would focus specifically and exclusively on contingency operations. So, as I've said before, in other contexts, all these recommendations are of a piece. It's a complete package, and so I think we need to do all of this at the same time. And it would save the government money, ultimately, if we were to do it. Yeah, I'd just like to add a, a different perspective, a little um, modification of that. Um, we clearly um, support, as um, my colleague just said, the need for the oversight. But, but I would also argue that better management would help a lot. And you wouldn't need as much oversight if you could get the better management. And because of that, we have recommended new positions be created in the executive branch to realize that managing contractors and managing contracts and deciding whether or not to actually use a contractor workforce to carry out the mission of the government is something that is part and parcel of a core mission for the government. It's not the back office administrative business, who cares, you know, let them take care of it. Um, it needs to also be incorporated into management. Well, the Obama administration is about to see a major surge in contractors there in Iraq. 17,000 contractors, 5,500 private security contractors as the military goes away. Are we just playing a little bit of a shell game here? 
And are they prepared to deal with what is going to happen in less than 90 days from now? Um, our recommendations were that they needed to pay more attention to um, getting those contractors in place and, and then overseeing their operations. We have been following this closely, obviously, for some time, and, and I think it is fair to say that we are very, very worried. And uh, as you heard earlier, um, we think that there needs to be oversight. Uh, they can't. Well, what, what are those worries? What, I mean, you're worried well, the, about the worries are very simple. I mean, what's going to happen? I, I can give you the worst case. The worst case is you have another Nizar Square thing, which is to say, uh, as what has happened in Iraq, some contractors go after somebody they think is shooting at them. There's a mob scene. The contractors are killed. It, everything spins out of control. I mean, it's a nightmare. And, and when you have 17,000 of them, as you say, you are asking for trouble. And without oversight, they can't hire these people. They can't train them. You have heard that. They can't so, train so if you are a contractor in Iraq, you are one of these 5,500, uh, who is your commander in chief? Who, who do they report to? Well, in theory, they are reporting to the embassy. Uh, but, you know, uh, the deputy chief of mission and the ambassador is not going to be managing operations of security contractors. You have got to have people accompanying them, government civilians, who will keep an eye on them and ensure that nothing untoward happens. And without that, we are simply asking for trouble. It is going to happen. I think Commissioner Shea said earlier, uh, when everybody takes blame, nobody is responsible. I think, if I get the quote right. So let us talk about these 5,500 security contractors. Who is ultimately responsible for those people? It's not, is, oh, in theory, who, who do we hold responsible for in that? Theory, it's the, the Secretary of State? In theory, it is the ambassador, and through the ambassador, the Secretary of State. Good luck. <laughs> if I can mention right. a legal point here, um, there, may, there is a giant loophole as far as legal accountability, as far as prosecutability of security people for doing something like Nizer Square. Um, the current statute clearly covers the military who are outside the United States. The contracting industry has has taken the position, though, that that statute, it is called the Military uh, Extraterritorial Jurisdiction Act, doesn't apply to State Department contractors. And so we recommended that that, as we are not the first, this is a recommendation that goes back to 2007, we recommended that just extend the Military Act to cover State Department civilians, well, you are going to have an a private army in Iraq, which in theory uh, the people there cannot be criminally prosecuted even if they committed homicide. One of the things that the State Department did that made a lot of sense, a few years ago we just had contractors providing all security for State, and we had problems. And so the State then put in charge a DS agent, one of their own agents in charge of every you know, convoy and so on that the State was involved. Uh, the amount of incidences were reduced significantly, uh, but they can't do this uh, to the extent now. They are being asked, in fairness to State, they are being asked to do something that I don't know how they are going to do it. They are being asked to basically do what the military did. My complaint with, with what State is doing is that they are not acknowledging that it is something that the government should do. And by not acknowledging it, you all aren't getting the information you need to say, my gosh, we've got a very serious problem here. They're saying, no, none of this is inherently governmental. That's simply wrong. It is inherently governmental. They're asking people to do something they shouldn't be doing. Well, the, to, to the rest of my uh, committee members here, I, this is one of the big concerns that we have. We can see it coming. We know it's about to happen. Um, we're playing a little bit of a shell game, drawing down the military, but bringing back up the security forces through contractors. Um, and, and I truly do worry about it. We do have an upcoming, uh, we'll pay having a hearing about the transition, and we'll continue to, to provide some oversight of that. Um, I'd like to recognize the gentlewoman from, uh, from New York if, if she has some additional questions. Otherwise, I think we'll. I, I, do, I, do. Yes. I do have questions uh, because I feel that. Uh, if we are in these countries, personally, I think we should bring our men and women home. Uh, but uh, given the point that you say that in the contract they don't adjust for the ability to competitively build it in the future, should the impact on future competition be factored into decisions about how to design the initial contract, 
Mr. Shea, should we do a contract from the beginning that requires competitive bidding in another year? Uh, would that help, particularly in areas that are less complicated than, than troops, such as food, fuel, and logistics? How hard is that? I, think I could even run the food. I could run the logistics. I, I think it should be the rule, but there will be some exceptions in the beginning of an operation. In the beginning, but you could put a time frame on it. And in your testimony, you argue that the wartime environment brings tremendous additional complications, just what you were saying. Yet the same basic rules apply whether an agency is contracting for laundry services in Helmont or, or ball bearings in, in Kansas. It's the base, same basic rules. And so do these additional complications suggest the need for special contracting regulations tailored to the wartime environment? Yes. You believe so. And uh, do you see any reason why we couldn't take, uh, take, a, take, for example, a food contract? Why can't we take the food contract and competitively bid it? Uh, we, 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 we support that very much. Um, one and, of the, and, and in terms of, by the way, length of time, there's a specific nuance in our Chapter 3 I want to bring out here which is that uh, the current practice has not only been uh, that, that the contractor gets whatever the term is in the contract and virtually automatically gets option years. We found no serious review of, of decisions that whether to give the fourth year or the fifth year out of, of a three-year plus two option year contract. But that at the end, the extension contract, and we had three billion dollar level examples is sole sourced to the contractor who's had it for the previous five years. Um, to take the translator contract, which hasn't been mentioned, although the food service one works the same way, the food one works the same way, translator contract was extended in two $500 million slices, sole sourced to the contractor who had held it previously. We could very well put a, 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 contractor, a contract um, strategy in place that would not let that happen. Well, let's go over what the contract strategy would be. Uh, first of all, it would be to uh, uh, make a list, advertise, and make a list of, say, 10 qualified bidders. These are people that are providing services in the United States. They're successful. They have financial resources. So you have to have a qualified list. Then let the qualified list bid on the contract, and the lowest bidder would win, and I, I would bet my arm, right arm, we would save billions of dollars under that scenario. Is there any way you would improve that, um, that road map? Uh, I, I just would say that, that they're providing, in the case of the cafeteria, they may be providing uh, food, but they're providing it in an area where the logistics requires them to have some unique capabilities. And, and so, uh, and we wouldn't always advocate the lowest bidder. We would want the, uh, the low bid. Lowest responsible bidder. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, I just make a point that I, I would feel terrible leaving uh, and ending this commission and acting like, well, providing food in Afghanistan and Iraq is the same as providing it somewhere else. It isn't. And so there are uh, But, but Mr. Commissioner, the in, in, the, in the RFP or in the request for proposal, you could put the specific requirements in. Yeah. Uh, do, you believe, you do you believe that other American companies aren't capable of providing uh, uh, translation, uh, logistics, fuel? Congressman Maloney, you and I do not have a basic disagreement. I just wanted to qualify your comments to make sure we realize that there are some unique parts to this. Otherwise, I think the Commission would look foolish in making an assumption like it's just like doing it in New York City or somewhere else. What I think we should do, because I, I, I like to do things and not just talk, uh, could, could we see if the Commission could take one area of these $3 billion contracts that they're giving out sole source, one area, <laughs> probably the simplest with the less complications, we, we, we no and, longer exist. and go forward and see if we can competitively, uh, competitively bid it? We no longer exist. Uh, we, we ended our work uh, this September, uh, and, uh, and now we are um, um, on to new things. We, we're well, gonna... Congratulations on your report. <laughs> thank you. Now recognize the, the chairman of the committee, Mr. Issa from uh, California. I thank the chairman. And, and I want to follow up on, on what I heard while I was in a meeting in the back. 
uh, uh, Professor Tiefer, the Commissioner, uh, CJA. Obviously, there's bipartisan support for reform, but isn't there a bigger problem that when Americans, or in some cases non-Americans, but under the American umbrella, operate overseas, we don't have a uniform standard today, period. Our military men and women have one standard. Our State Department covered employees have another. Our contractors have yet another, and we could go into a couple other derivatives. In, in any reform we do, not just closing the loophole, not just assuring that a contractor who violates law overseas can be held accountable in the U.S., but shouldn't we also try to have a uniform presentation of what an American or agent of America would expect in a foreign nation while doing the bidding of the American people? Well, on, uh, on the main aspect of what you are saying, that is exactly right. It is currently a patchwork system. It has been moved this way at one time, a different direction at another time, another direction at a third time. So, yes, there is no uniformity and consistency as if it had been uh, thought out. Um, but I am I'm going to let me, let me mention why. It was a rhetorical question to get you to go further. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, why would we want to put a patch on a particular hole right now? Because right now there is no immunity from Iraqi justice for the security personnel that we have in Iraq. Now, while we had, while we had military people doing that, the Iraqi had this attitude as elsewhere. Well, they will be controlled, they will be prosecuted, they are under American law. They can even be court-martialed under, under American law. That is fine with us. Heck, they can be court-martialed for not paying their just debts. We have a pretty strong UCMJ. I, if given a choice, I would much rather be in civil <laughs> court than in court-martial. But um, what is going to happen if there are incidents involving these civilian security contractors for the State Department is that we are going to have this choice. We can either let Iraqi justice proceed, and, and, and my sympathy is for the contractors faced in that situation, or we can hustle them out of the country before the Iraqis can get to them, which will not aid in our relations with the Iraqis. Good point. I want to follow up on one last question, and, and I think this probably goes to Commissioner Henke and uh, to Commissioner Zakheim. And I'll start with you, Commissioner. You made the point of seconding those people from DOD to State if that allows us to have this inherently governmental job be done by gov trained, experienced, prepared government people who understand rules of engagement and can make such adjustments. If you could elaborate a little bit on, let us assume for a moment that that is a model not just in one country where we have agreed to remove our armed, uniform armed forces, but taken to all other hot spots in which the State Department today is using alternatives to, if you will, their own forces. Uh, how could we do that in a way that protected that status of forces, if you will, that normally the uniformed military has when they are seconded to the uh, uh, State Department? Well, as, as you just heard from my colleague, Commissioner Tiefer, the, the, it is just much too complicated when you are dealing with civilians. I mean, our whole approach to civilians is so outdated. Now I am speaking personally. I know the Commission is over, but we have been speaking as a Commission. I am just speaking as, as Once a commission, individual. always a commission. Well, you, just, right. you just can't make recommendations right. the way you could have before. Um, we are still living with the 1883 Civil Service Act, with Chester Allen Arthur's Act. It is crazy. And one of the problems we face is that we simply have not updated the role of civilians in the 21st century. So your concern is part of that. We ought to be able to second civilians. We ought to be able to have some uniform code of civilian justice, to give it a name, that, that applies to all civilians, wherever they are serving, whoever they are serving. Once you do that, it becomes a lot easier to augment the State Department or any other agency, for that matter, in a variety of contingency situations. We simply don't have that. We have, as Commissioner Tiefer said, a patchwork and nothing more. And I think I will end with uh, probably Commissioner Henke. 
you have seen DOD in your two roles. I was taking uh, Commissioner uh, Zaheim at, at a different point, which was these are active duty military personnel who would, like a military liaison officer work for an ambassador, would in fact run a garrison, if you will, potentially out of uniform, but still active duty military. That is the only instant fix we would have that I can see for replacing DOD uniformed people in our current situation of 5,500 promised and needed, but promised not to be uniformed military. Do you see any way for us to, uh, if you will, dot the I or uh, turn a circle into a box? Because I am very concerned, and I think both sides of the aisle should be concerned, that another square somewhere in, a, in Iraq could turn into a real problem for the State Department with some of those 5,500 people. And then the question is, are these military or at least Federal employees who have the full faith and, and it is somebody in the chain of command's mistake, or is it, quote, you hired a bad contractor and now we have to deal with it? And it, and it goes beyond the question of who, who tries them. It is a question of we are going to be responsible for those people, even if they are contractors. How are we going to ensure that all the way through the Secretary of State and the President there is some accountability for an Army that is larger than most units I served in in the Army myself? Mr. Chairman, I think there, there has to be a way to figure out uh, along the continuum of embassies that State has. There are some that are low threat, low risk, some that are medium, some that evolve into a high risk. And, and as long as the management controls are in place for contracted security and they are vetted contractors and they are trained and certified contractors, there is this idea out there about a third party certification like an ISO 9000 certification for private security. That makes a lot of sense. No, another idea is don't require in law the State Department to choose to they, they must choose low price, low bid, technically acceptable contracts for security. Give them the ability to say, I want to do best value security in that high risk circumstance. When it gets beyond high risk and it gets into combat, that, that's the province of the military, and State and DOD have to be able to figure out, uh, without subordinating State to DOD and making it an arm of DOD, nobody wants that. But there needs to be a way to operate as separate agencies, but recognize the gate guards at the Kabul Embassy who were attacked on September 13th. You know, OMB issues this policy guidance on September 12th that says, look, security and combat is inherently governmental. Here is a list of other ideas. The day after the Kabul embassy was under attack for four, five, six hours and several people were killed, if that is not combat, I don't know what is. And um, I, I, would, I would, State and uh, DOD have to be able to figure out a way to operate more seamlessly for us to have an effective foreign policy apparatus. Any other guidance you could give us on something we may legislate from any of the commissioners? I would just add something on, on this question that is beyond um, what we looked at while we were operating, but there are an awful lot of other trained security forces throughout the civilian side of the U.S. government. And one of the things that we saw in looking at Iraq and Afghanistan is that really the rest of the civilian government was not participating in a way that, um, that we thought was useful um, for what is a common U.S. policy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Will the gentleman yield? In line with the gentleman's question, and I think uh, the Commissioner, you raised a lot of good points. Combat is very, very different, and, and, this, and, and I'm not questioning the standards, but what happens when we have a multi-million dollar contractor that is an exclusive provider of an essential service that is needed, and uh, say, say there's some serious abuses that were alleged against some of the providers? Um, that, that they were very, very serious abuses. I'm, and we've had hearings on them, specifically Blackwater. Um, but, but what happens when the, the contract is led appropriately, it's professional people, uh, but there's some serious abuses? Then, then, then who is a, accountable in that you know, it's a type of situation? Is contractually accountable? Yeah, say, say you have a, a, a contractor providing an essential service. 
And then there are serious abuses that become almost international uh, outcries. And, and who is responsible then? The contractor? Or, or how do you handle it? You know, in, in certain cases, and they, they said we're private contractors, and they just completely, no one was accountable. Yep. Well, so I in, just wonder what your answer is. In the, in the example of the Kabul embassy where we had the guards who were mm -hmm. drinking and partying and cavorting off duty, um, the contractor was responsible. The government overseers were responsible. But, you know, ultimately, they besmirched the reputation of the United States. And that's why, that, to me, that's the very definition of, of, of high risk and where we don't want to have uh, uh, our foreign policy outcomes at risk because of the way a low bid contractor performs in a combat zone. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I want, again, uh, on behalf of the Committee of the United States Congress, thank you for your great work. An awful lot of time and effort and talent is going into this, and we do appreciate it. I would like to give you an opportunity to have any other final comments uh, that you would like to share with us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would, I would love to jump in just for a second and, and say, first, uh, the, the Congress and um, the general public wanted the military to be the tip of the spear. So we have put all our resources to say, you know, you fight the fight. And that, I think, makes sense. It does mean that you can't go to war without contractors. So this commission is not besmirching the fact that we have to depend on contractors. That was by design. What is of concern is that the QDR, the Quadrennial Review of the Military, hardly makes mention of the fact that we depend on contractors, we need to integrate them in a way that's effective. We are saying that we think we're over-dependent on contractors. That's another issue. But we clearly understand that, that we have them and we need them. Um, my colleague, Ms. Shanazi, made this reference to the fact of concern about the number of civilians. And the fact is we have a huge number of military, a huge number of contractors, and I was really stunned by the low level of civilians, government employees who are actually in theater. Uh, it's, there's such a difference. And then I became even more stunned by, and stunned is the word, we have to entice civilians, civil servants, I mean, to go there by doubling their salary, giving them hardship pay, overseas pay, overtime. Uh, and it is amazing the number of employees who make twice plus what they made here. And that's an issue I think we didn't really fully address. But how, what do we do to get more civil servants taking a role in that area? And then if I could add, and if I could get the attention of um, Mr. Issa, I would love it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just want to say to you uh, in closing, I yes, just want yes to thank Mr. Commissioner. You. I want to thank you for your opening words, how gracious they were. I want to thank you for your concern about this very issue, that you have uh, worked with others on both sides of the aisle to get at waste, fraud, and abuse on a bipartisan way. I appreciate, and the Commission appreciates, the work that you've done. We also want to thank Mr. Tierney, years ago, reaching out to the Republican side to establish uh, this commission, which then leads me to my final comments that I will make as a commissioner. Uh, Michael Tebow, my co-chairman, uh, did a terrific job. Uh, he encountered a huge uh, serious illness in his family that uh, caused him to pay great attention to that. He lost family members. He's missed both hearings because of uh, being with family uh, at a time of some great grievance. Um, and so he didn't have the opportunity to present at the Senate or here. I just want to be on record as saying how much we valued his work. Uh, and then to say that I have never had such an easy job being a, a co-chairman because I worked with such extraordinary uh, people. Uh, and so in conclusion, I just thank Congress for giving me this opportunity, uh, the Speaker for giving me the opportunity, and Mitch McConnell for uh, allowing me to be the co-chairman as well. And thank you for allowing me to put that on the record. Thank you. But I did note that you were saying you did it, got an upgrade in your colleagues after leaving Congress. <laughs> you know, I found myself going there, and I thought I'd better back off. But, Mr. Chairman, I should also say we do have one um, uh, criticism of this committee. Um, we had a very fine counsel 
named Rich Butel, who was working, and, and the next thing we knew, he decided to raise the status of his position and work for this committee. Uh, but we missed him. Well, you know, we, we don't pay a lot, but we offer long-term uh, employment, something your commission couldn't. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you again, all. We appreciate it. The committee stands adjourned.